We good? Do you need all this surface? I can <laughs> count how <out laughs> together. Yeah. Just yeah, a yeah, joke. Yeah, yeah. Just a joke. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank, thank you, Esther. Okay, let's get started. We um, did have a presentation from our um, Auditor General um, at the, a board meeting recently, and what we are doing today during this work session is just uh, taking an opportunity to answer any questions that board members may have before we vote on this um, work on uh, at our next board meeting on June 30th. Um, there were a few questions that came up at the board meeting, and so given that, um, I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, if you were able to take a look at the um, report that was put together around this statement of work for FY 2023, the first sentence actually states that um, the mission of OAG is to independently determine whether the existing processes for Fairfax County Schools are adequately designed, operating in an efficient, effective manner, and fully accountable to the Fairfax County citizens. So if we want um, the Auditor General to go beyond that into um, looking at programs or um, spe very specific work, then we often need to bring in outside experts to do that. Our special education um, review is a good example of that. Um, in some cases, some of the, I think the questions that have come up or some of the audit topics that have been proposed are perhaps things that are better done by ISD or um, ORC or another organization. So if we can just kind of keep that in mind as we bring up some ideas. Um, what we want to do at our next board meeting is vote on this statement of work um, for FY23. As we know, um, if there is an emergency or a big topic that comes up during the year, like this year uh, we had the, uh, the legal invoices, um, we do make changes to um, you know, the audit statement of work as we move forward. And you know, Ms. Cub will talk a little bit more about that. And she will also talk about how this work was prioritized. We'll go into that in a little bit more detail than we did at the board meeting. So we will today run through the presentation that you saw at the board meeting quickly because we added that additional specificity uh, for board members to understand how that happened. Um, also, um, in, I just wanted to point out an area that was of interest for many um, but is not on our list of priorities for FY23 for OAG is teleworking. And um, there's an explanation, and um, Ms. Coe can go into more detail if we need it, but um, that is an example of where we don't necessarily need to audit procedures, but we need to make sure we have a policy in place and uh, regulations that can be clearly communicated and implemented, um, as many workplaces are needing to do um, post-COVID-19. So um, that might be something we would need to work with governance um, as far as drafting a policy and not would not be something that OAG would be working on in FY23. Okay, um, also I just want to note that we do have a next steps document um, for all of our uh, work sessions today. So if there are things you need to be putting into next steps, um, that document is open in Google. So with that explanation, I will turn it over to um, Ms. Esther Coe and her team. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Tolan. Um, good morning, I think we're still morning, everyone. It's always great to come here to speak with you all at a work session and be able to connect and answer any questions. And before I uh, briefly refresh the presentation that I did earlier last month, I want to introduce my very capable teams who is here with me. And to my left is Mr. Chris Muyacho. He is our Deputy Auditor General. And to my right is Ms. Danelle Moore, and she is our very experienced Auditor 3. Um, so with that, I would like to um, just again refresh our memories on the presentation, highlight the key points, and also the changes that we have made to further enhance this presentation. Just like Ms. Tolan mentioned, how to be able to answer some of the questions already from the presentation. 
So with that, um, here are the contents. We are going to drill down about the how, the how we identify the plan, and what are the considerations and the proposal um, in today's work sessions. And slide three, Slide three is the why. Um, just like Ms. Tolan mentioned, the school board has tasked the Office of Auditor General to look at processes at FCPS, um, whether they are adequately designed, operated, uh, operated in an efficient and effective way, and be fully accountable to our citizen members. And of course, also with the audit is to further promote our strategic goals and within the Auditor General Charter, which is Policy 1105, that the school board tasks us to present our audit plan, our work plan, statement of work to the uh, school board on an annual basis. And then going on is to talk about the how. And I think some of the questions we got from the presentation night is about the how to prioritize certain topics. So um, first of all, is actually it is, is pretty you know in, streamlined that we looked at the entire audit universe that we could audit, and we identified 47 of them come to the list. And then, of course, we looked at what is happening in the world as well, because audit is changing the landscape, similar how we operate the K-12 education, that we have the pandemic, and we need to consider that as the consideration to think about what to audit in the next fiscal year. How do we prioritize, which is step number two, that we speak with many of you. We also collected your feedback via survey, email. We also got feedback from FCPS employees. We spoke with our leadership team members, coordinator, directors, principal association, et cetera. And then we also do independent benchmarking with the K-12 education internal audit functions and see what they are looking. And then after getting all this information, we consider the different types of risk. Risk meaning challenges, concern, may not be happening, but inherently it can happen within the K-12 education. We looked at what is the dollar sign attached to that audit topic. If it go wrong, would that, what, what would be the reputational impact on FCPS? What is the operational risk, et cetera? And then we determine the plan. So um, slide five for everyone um, uh, understanding, this is a new slide that we added. There is no information, but what we did is we moved some of the tables from the detailed document that we also attached together with the presentation inside the presentation to explain about why we select the first five um, primary priorities. Sorry that I keep looking back to be safe, that, that is the right slide. Um, that, that there are five new topics uh, this year, including employee evaluation, continuous monitoring specifically for SO3, IT cybersecurity, local school activity funds, as well as the succession planning and leadership development. Here you can see that we outline some of the considerations, including the dollar impact, financial indicators, as well as some other information. We included here about the interest from the school board and audit committee members as well as the employees, and also indicate if such topics are identified through via the benchmarking exercise or not. Again, the benchmarking exercise, we focus on the K-12 education. And the next slide um, is uh, we receive a question from a school board uh, member asking, hey, Esther, two of the topics are actually not identified as common benchmarking topics, why we are doing it. So with this slide, we would like to address that question. Um, specifically, it is related to two uh, topics. One is the employee evaluation process. The other one is the succession planning and leadership development topics. Um, the reason why OAG would like to propose both of them is because of the high level of interest from the school board and audit committee members, as well as um, as well as that this is closely tied to our strategic goals. Um, and also we have looked at some of the research as well. So we would like to put those two topics forward. Um, as a side note, as um, Ms. Tolan mentioned in the opening, we, um, 
currently we are conducting the legal audit, and because of that, we have postponed the employee evaluation process audit, which was identified through the last year um, audit cycle. So I just want to add that consideration for you all. So slide seven is the result. I think likely we can stop here afterwards, but I think here is a major result. The top uh, four topics are the one that we have started working on and we are looking at finishing in early FY23. And I will go to each one of them in a uh, little bit. And then the uh, uh, number five through number 10 are the topics that we listed, why they are the primary focus for this fiscal year, as well as we have some other OAG duties that we want to highlight. So I'm a very visual looking person. I love to see, hey, Esther, what is the plan? When are you going to finish the audits that you proposed? So here is the chart that you can see um, the approximate timeline between fiscal year um, 23 that we are going to do. We are looking at finishing the top four carry forward audits before October of this year, um, and then we will start the new audits proposed beginning in September. So going through uh, slide nine over, and I, I'm sorry that we're gonna talk a little bit more about details of the various audits. Um, so we're going to zoom in about the specific, about the description, objective, who are the stakeholders, and the schedule of the various audits. So the first one is a very key initiative that school board has initiated about the, um, the review of our special education services. So um, if I may just comment, and I remember on the night of the presentation, we add a little bit more context that the um, vendor, American Institutes for Research, Research has completed with all the data collection activities as of today. So right now they are analyzing the data and we are looking for meeting the scheduled deliverable date back to the school board in fall of this year. So we are looking at between September and November for the final uh, for the presentation to the school board. And moving on, number two is the IT um, technology audit where we are focusing on the flow, the process of how we're managing the laptops. We also add one piece, and I believe it was one of the school board uh, requests last year when this audit was approved to look at the project management aspect of this audit. So uh, moving on, number three is the legal audit that we just talked about, and I think most of you are familiar with that, so I won't go through the details here. And then the next one is the local school activity fund audit for this um, fiscal year, which is ending in a few days, June 30th of two, uh, 2022, where um, it is a state requirements that we looked at it every year. From a financial standpoint, just want to give you all a, um, an understanding. It accounted for roughly $22 million a year for local school activity fund. So with that, I would like to turn the mic over to Chris to talk about the new um, uh, audit topics. Great, thank you. Um, so number five is employee evaluation process audit. Um, this might be familiar to you because it was on the fiscal year 22 audit plan. It was postponed because of the legal audit. Um, but we are pushing that to fiscal year 23. And I'll just talk about some of the objectives. And, and all audits are, are to answer questions, and the objectives are the, the questions that are being asked. So it's to evaluate the existing employee evaluation process, um, to also look at how the process is being managed throughout the district, and also the benchmark existing processes as well, used by other school districts to identify best practices. And this performance audit, we're looking to take about five months, as you've seen on the schedule. The next one I'm gonna talk about is the continuous monitoring, which is gonna include the ESSER 3. So you're very familiar that we are doing continuous monitoring out at the schools, testing some of the financial transactions. Um, so we're also including the ESSER 3 compliance, looking at the financial transactions as well. Um, and so we'll be doing that on a continuous basis um, and reporting back to the audit committee. The next slide just talks about our tactics with the continuous monitoring. We typically do our auditing sampling basis, and so this year 
we're going to start to include some um, different tactics, not just doing sampling, but trying to use our audit technology to look at the whole population and look for any irregular irregularities, and um, and hopefully the the software will add additional coverage to the ESRA three and the other areas that we're looking at with continuous monitoring. Uh, next up is the IT cybersecurity audit. Um, and then this one is just, we have a lot of objectives here, um, just focusing on the sufficiency of the monitoring of the, our network, um, evaluation, evaluating the compliance with policies and procedures around cybersecurity, um, determining if the process is aligned with the leading practices, and also we're going to be surveying employees. Okay. Um, so this, this audit we anticipate taking six months and because of the sensitivity of this, um, this will be fully exempt from the public um, discussion. The next audit is the local school activity funds for the fiscal year 2023. Uh, I won't go too much into that, um, something that we've been doing year after year and we we'll continue to do. Uh, last audit, new engagement for the year is the succession planning and leadership development. And this is where we're going to determine whether FCVS has developed and executed succession plan and leadership development strategy for coordinators and above and non-school-based administrators. And also we're going to analyze that same category of uh, employees, their profile and stat statistics such as leadership skill gaps. And lastly, we're going to do research and best practices research on that topic and compare those concepts with FCPS's current practice. Um, and we anticipate that taking about five months as well. Okay, I will turn it back over to Ms. Ko. So thank you, Chris. So I think with that, we cover, you know, the major audit topics that we propose for the school board to consider. And here on this list is some of the other OAG duties that we have been focused on doing. And every time when I come to speak with the school board, I really want to take this opportunity to thank all of you because um, you have helped us, you know, to promote our office so that the community members know about the hotline that they can call. They know about our audit bus, which is our periodical. And I just can't help but to take this opportunity to say now we have over 1,700 uh, subscribers to the audit bus to really raise awareness about who we are and what we do. So really appreciate for your collaboration. Um, and with that, just a few slides left that is talking about some other potential audit topics that have rise to the horizon, but because of the limitation of, like, of, of our staff, we have seven auditors, including myself, we are all hands on deck. So some of the topics, um, even though there may be a slightly higher um, like uh, interest focus, we will not be able to do them in this fiscal year. Um, of course, they are critical items. It's just about the when to look at them. So there are uh, a few of them. The first one is about the FOIA and the FERPA process audit. Um, that we know that currently there is a new process that is ongoing and our communication office is in the process of building that team. So we suggested that while this is a very critical topic, we suggest to audit it in a later time, not in FY23. Following that is the tally work audit, as Ms. Tolan has mentioned, that um, this topic we received uh, quite a lot of interest from the employees and one school board member um, because we have already looked at one of the HR audit topic this fiscal year, so we propose to not look at it this fiscal year 23. 
And then the next one is the, is the project management division-wide um, audit. That this topic we received um, interest from five school board members and one employee. And again, we know that this is a very important initiative within FCPS. Um, our thought is that, that our new superintendent will be joining us very soon. It may be good for her to have an opportunity to take a look at what she has, and then we can see where we go in a year, and then to we look at that in FY24. The next topic is curriculum development, um, and this is a topic that we received from one of the school board member, um, like Ms. Tolan Open, uh, since what it is being asked for in the description is not the core competency of OAG, we do not recommend to include it in FY23, but if the school board think, um, collectively think this is uh, a goal, uh, a, a, a subject that we should focus on, we can hire a, consider to hire an external expert similar to the arrangement for the special education review. Um, but as of right now, we hasn't been putting it on our proposed plan for FY23. And last but not the least is just some um, bullet points um, that if the community members are looking at it, if they want to know more about our mission, that we are independent, report um, directly to the school board, they can hit hit on this link to get more information. And with that, I would like to hand the time back to um, our Madam Chair and see if any one of you have questions. Okay, well, <laughs> since you, I, oh, I'm sorry, okay. <laughs> I thought you were waiting on me. I was like, what chair? Oh, I am sorry. I'm sorry. I did not use the right terminology, and I apologize. It's Ms. Tolan. I was waiting for someone to put their card up, and we have Ms. McLaughlin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I would like maybe a little more clarity on the project management division-wide um, rationale. Uh, I really do appreciate what you're saying, that we have a new superintendent coming in. Um, and that you might want to wait, but I, I'm also mindful that she is going to come in and have a vast system to learn. And so I think it certainly would be extremely beneficial to her and the board that we would have had a assessment of where are we to then know where we need to get to. So I, I will just share with my colleagues that um, this is not a new topic. This has been something that Dr. Braybrand, I greatly appreciate. You have given voice and respect for how important project management is. And um, I, I'm, I'm frankly disappointed to see this one being postponed. I will say to my colleagues that, you know, maybe we need to have further conversation um, in, with, our, with our Auditor General to understand what it is we are hoping from um, by doing this as opposed to the waiting. I just, I'm not, otherwise I'm not sure how our new superintendent can get us there and we can't keep waiting year upon year upon year to be this complex of a system. So that, that part disappoints me a bit. Um, and you know, the, the FOIA and the FERPA audit, um, I would again ask professionally from our Auditor General and her team that if we're, you know, look at, look at the interest level, 21 employees. I mean, something tells you there that um, this is of high interest um, and we know it's an issue. So one thought that I would have is if we, if you wanna wait because there's supposedly new processes putting in place and I'm respectful of that, then I would ask Dr. Braybrand, you know, I know you can't commit anything for the new superintendent, but your team is your team, that we could at least get periodic updates of what does this look like? Because in the end, the board is, you know, the, the ultimate um, body accountable to the system. Every lawsuit, every loss of funds, loss of reputation, anything, it all falls on the shoulders of the board. And so if we end up saying things like, well, yeah, they're working on it. Well, we need to be asking for, for very clear and timely and reasonable updates so that it's not like we're just not monitoring it all. So um, that's, that's my 12 seconds, but you know, um, 
in addition to Dr. Braber and Dr. Uh, Ms. Coe, I would appreciate if you could maybe respond to the things I've raised. Uh, just a couple of quick comments. One, definitely on FOIA and FERPA, we've added a few things in the budget here that you guys just passed and we can give some updates on where we are in doing that hiring and um, how we're uh, better organizing that office. School districts across the country, this is an important thing for you all to know, school districts across the country are being overwhelmed with FERPA and FOIA requests. And frankly, the General Assembly just passed rules that are going to make what has become a flood, maybe the largest flood since Noah um, got on his ark. Point so, of clarification, Mr. Superintendent, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, do they follow the same FOIA rules that we do? Uh, they do not. Just checking. You're, you're, that's a good question. And, and, and honestly, but we can absolutely do updates. <laughs> we can do updates. The other, listen, obviously it's between you and the Auditor General what your scope of work is. We have taken seriously the board's feedback about project management. I have taken it seriously as superintendent. We've been building the team this year. We're doing project management within our departments and always have been, um, but it hasn't been cross-functional. That's the part we're building and we're doing it with our ESSER funds this very year. Um, so this is just about, I, I think in the end, the snapshot of where the work is and when do you want it. We're in the beginning stages um, of doing that and we're doing it focusing on ESSER funds right now that is really in a sense cross-departmental because we're doing it in facilities instruction. Um, we're still building out doing what are all of the projects that would be under project management. So that's just the, that's the reality of it. When you want to dipstick it is up to the board, but we have uh, earnestly started uh, on it and um, it's going to make us a better system. Thank you. So if I may um, also uh, respond to Ms. Glaufland's question, and, um, and, and first of all, I just want to say I'm really grateful for the questions because when we talk, Megan always shared with us, you know, what we need to see strategically as a big picture from a division-wide perspective. So I just want to say I'm very grateful for that very candid feedback. And, um, if I may also just share with the with the board about from my perspective about why not, and you can also see that we are very deliberate to put both topics in the deck. It's not they are not important, but it's, we are just trying to fit our resources into what we think are the top priorities. Um, with project management division wide topic, um, my. My sincere understanding is that we have incorporated that as part of the IT asset management audit. And again, this is not looking at division-wide, and I think the focus the school board would like us to do with this division-wide is the overall how the different departments, offices are working together. But my hope is from the IT audit project management review, it can give us an idea how good or how not good the system has been working out as a first step. Um, and of course, that's not the end of it. If we say, oh my goodness, nothing like happening is correct, then of course we need to put this, the project management division-wide audit front and center. And like Ms. Tolan opened up in the conversation, this is not set in stone. It can be changed throughout. So this is a very fluid topic. So my suggestion to the board for consideration is, let's see what is the result from the IT project management audit, which we are excited to release that in fall, like maybe September, October is only a few months down. And if we see that there are missing a lot of pieces, then we have to, like Ms. McLaughlin, you say, we really need to do this now, now. Um, so, so that's our considerations for, for you to, to consider. And then the other uh, situation about the FOIA and FERPA audits, and totally when we first talk about how we prioritize, right? Reputational risk, legal risk is the top risk that we looked at. Um, um, and the reason why we don't put it in FY23 
is two reasons. One is because within the scope of the current legal audit, we did incorporate one aspect of FOIA and FERPA process. But again, that is one aspect of a specific you know, incident towards legal invoices. And again, I mean, from that audit, if we see the system is not working out, is not the process is not efficient and effective, like go back to our mission, right? Then we can update our plan to elevate this topic, right? Or to hire someone else, I mean, to do, uh, to do all the audits that we proposed. But we can wait and see when we get more information to make that de determination, if it makes sense. So that's from our office point of view. Great. Um, thank you so much. And you know how much I value you and your department. Uh, Ms. Karen Keys Gamara, followed by Karen Corbett Sanders. Thank you. Um, I want to follow up on the question that uh, Ms. Tolan posed with us, and I'd like to pose it to you. Um, she asked, Are there topics? If, if, she asked us to consider whether there were topics that would be better handled by different departments. And so I, I think we need to start with your recommendation with respect to that question. Uh, I can go first, and if Ms. Tolan or other school board members have comments to that. So I think currently our hope is to be able to do the proposed audits completely in-house. Mm -hmm. um, I think as OAG, I think we should portray to the citizens that, that we really are great you know, financial steward. We would like to be able to embrace, be able to look at the risk, the highest risk, internally first. In terms of currently, we still have the special education review ongoing that um, I'm sure, Karen, you are fully uh, embracing and aware of. So that has a financial you know, implication on that because we're hiring someone external to do it. Um, and, and just similar to the legal audit as well, we need subject matter expert. Um, we may need uh, to get someone external to support us with the cybersecurity audit, which we already incorporated in this year plan. Um, but fortunately, we do have a very um, competent IT auditor in-house. So we would like to have him to help us with the IT audit but I may come to the audit committee and to the school board and say, hey, based upon what we look at, we may need to solicit outside support because cybersecurity change every day. Um, so that may be a likelihood. Um, in order to ask, uh, to, to respond to Karen, your question, I think for now, we should be able to handle the audits that we propose in this document in-house, um, except for some of the ongoing audits that the school board is aware of. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to tell us what your recommendations are. Um, you did mention, or at least in the question, um, that there may be departments that would be more likely or better suited. So I wanted to get those distinctions, if there are any. Thank you. Thank you for, for that further clarification. So um, that questions come out a lot about um, whether, like, can we support and help with the program evaluation, right? To really see how effective a program is. And um, if I may just take this opportunity to explain that a little bit more is currently within the Office of Auditor General, you have certified public accountants, you have certified fraud examiner, you have certified internal auditors, you have certified information system auditor, but we don't have PhD in education or we don't have um, those very specific skill set. And my recommendation to the board is that um, I would rather to hire those people if at the time that we need, because those are very special skill set that may be different based upon the projects that the school board would like us to do. So thank you, Karen, for clarifying that. But okay. that's kind of like what we have right now within the office. And we can always tackle extra projects, but we may not have the expertise in-house. Then at that time, we will need to hire external vendors. OK, I may have misunderstood the question. I thought she mentioned ORSI and other groups within FCPS 
are you looking for some type of reliance on them? So can, do you want me to just clarify? The, sure. The comment I was making was more, I think, around the topics that are not on this list okay. of five for next year. And part of the, like, curriculum, there was one was, you know, curriculum, looking at ISD and how they develop curriculum and is it the best way to develop curriculum and is it innovative? That may be better looked at other departments in FCPS than OAG, for exactly okay. what Esther was just saying. Okay. So, or the telework, for example, is really an HR kind of policy topic. Right. But I see the auditor's role in monitoring how that policy is implemented. Is it effective? Is it a, 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 an area where the board may need to set a policy, right? so that we don't have disparities that uh, result in inefficiencies uh, or in, in something that is not achieving the goal that we thought that it was doing. So I see that a little bit different, so I was curious as to how those two comments meshed. Go ahead. If I may just take one last minute, I feel like I have taken up too much time for you all to ask questions, but to, to clarify that, Karen, I think what first come to my mind is, um, of course, internally our departments are very competent and capable to look at the program. I'm thinking from the school board point of view, we may also want to consider the independence, objectivity component, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think for me as the Auditor General, this is something very critical because our integrity, you know, is relied on our reporting structure, where do, do we belong? So we report directly to the school board so we can protect that. So to answer, so, so, so my thought is, right, if it is something that, that the school board would like to have the independent point of view, then we would likely be better to hire an external um, uh, a subject matter expert to support. But if it is something more operational that our LT members, our internal research and also strategic improvement office can support, that would be best, right, too. So I think it's depending on the ask. Right, so I think I misunderstood the question and I wanted the clarity because we can't, what we're always looking for from you is that independence, right? And we can go directly to the department and say, hey, what are you doing? Uh, but that's like a, a self-evaluation, and, and the value is you're looking at it from an objective viewpoint. So the, the second thing that I <clears throat> want to raise, and it may sound a little bit like a tangent, but Dr. Uh, Braybrand mentioned the issue, and I think uh, Megan asked about this, or Ms. McLaughlin, with respect to uh, the FOIA requests and the new state mandates. This may not have anything to do with you per se, Dr. Brabrand, but I would like um, for this board to have an opportunity to talk about how we're going to respond. It is my understanding that prior to any changes, we had, a, what, five or six days to respond to a FOIA request, even if people were asking for 10,000 pages. Um, and so the public doesn't understand that those documents have to be redacted, that we have to protect, uh, we have to comply with FERPA, et cetera. Um, and so it creates, uh, as anybody who peruses Twitter, a, uh, a, public, uh, a public image anomaly that is just not factual. So I'm hoping that we can, uh, Dr. Brabant, and forgive me, uh, Ms. Coe, I think that since we're talking about the FOIA is issue, we've got to do some clarification so that our constituents understand the position we are currently placed in and what this legislation um, imposes on us. Yeah, glad to do more communication. Glad to do more communication about it, um, and we can work with our OCCR team to better explain to the community what's going on. We're committed to transparency. We've tried, I've tried, and our team to put out more information uh, in an easier uh, fashion. Um, but it is a true statement that across this country there are increased demands for FOIA requests and school districts are simply overwhelmed to meet the state uh, timelines. And the General Assembly has now actually made it uh, more um, 
more onerous and um, there really isn't an equivalent response for that at the state level. I support and I believe we all support transparency at all levels of government um, and uh, we need to figure out though the right models that balance transparency in government for continuing to operate um, the system and serve our kids which is our all of our primary focus. My time is up. Thank you. Ms. Cover Sanders. Yes, thank you. And thank you, Esther, for all of the work of your organization. It is always really well appreciated, the, um, the thoughtful and uh, very responsible approach that you take to all of your work. So thank you. A couple things. One, um, I do support the succession planning piece of this. I would hope that that would be looked at also with an equity lens. And actually at some point, I mean, we talked about the need for an ed equity policy today. I would suggest that we actually need to do an equity audit at some point to address whether or not we are uh, doing the work with uh, fidelity. Regarding employee evaluations, I'm a little surprised that that one made your list and would be supportive of substituting that one out at some point. Um, and my reasoning is that we are about to embark on collective bargaining and the whole employee evaluation process is likely to be addressed in that context. So um, when we only have a limited amount of resources to do this type of work in the um, OAG's office, I think that we should take that into account. Um, additionally, I think that the project management, as uh, Ms. McLaughlin raised, is something that is of critical importance. And it's not only important in our cyber work, but it's actually important in everything we do um, to the level of school buildings. And so um, the uh, responsible approach to project management as a key cultural uh, mindset uh, and critical to the way that we ensure things are done with fidelity, I think is important. And so I would encourage that we relook at including project management the questions regarding the um, OAG uh, versus ORSI and others, um, I do appreciate your comments on this. It does beg the question of, you know, when the OAG was established, whether it was going to be an auditor general or if it was going to take on broader roles. And so under the new superintendent, I do think it warrants a conversation about whether the strategic placement of different organizations and whether we need to reinforce um, or move additional things into your um, area. Um, two additional areas, and then I'm cognizant of 26 seconds left. One is this board adopted a security audit at our last board meeting in the, um, uh, after Uvalde, and I would hope that the OAG would have a role in defining the parameters for that security audit and overseeing it. And so I don't know what conversations have been undertaken in that, but I would like to better understand it. And one last on the FOIA, and I know I'm out of time, but I'll throw it out there, is we should have a dashboard prominently on our site for every FOIA request saying these are the FOIA requests, this is how many FOIA requests have been made, pending, satisfied. So thank you again, Karen, like as a um, very clearly with the different thought, with the different types of considerations for us to, you know, to, to think about. Um, the employee evaluation process, if I may go with that one first, it is an audit that was um, approved back last fiscal year. Um, and of course, things we can adopt, we, w we can change that when there are other more prominent topics. Um, the reason why um, I am still proposing that to the school board is because evaluation is such an important tool to support employees, to create a caring culture, to have a welcoming environment. Um, we know that, that, that the 
uh, evaluation process on school-based staff members versus operational staff members are quite different. Um, so we see that there may be an opportunity to add it further to help strengthening our process. And again, our focus is always on the process. Um, we, we do aware that with the, um, the, the, the changes in the employee evaluation process as well as the, um, the negotiation that is happening right now with our staff members, um, if the school board think you know, that this topic may, may be better to delay, we are happy to do that. We are just looking more at a process perspective that this impacts every single one of the employee. Um, so that's why we, we proposed it. Um, and then uh, I think I, I talked about the project management division, why consideration a little bit ago. So, but I, I, I do hear, Karen, from your perspective, this is a critical process that we need to consider. Um, and maybe let me look at Chris and Danielle, other thoughts. And we definitely have our equity audit to be considered. We literally just received more, more, more training from our uh, chief equity officer uh, office about how to consider that in our audit. We also pay a lot of attention about how the other audit offices are doing too, right, across the nation. Um, this is a very um, emerging area, if I may say. So, so far, I haven't really seen a very tight audit program to how to ex how to how to evaluate it so far. But you are absolutely right, Karen. This is on our forefront that we have to really think about. Okay, now we have the policy, we have the different procedures that we put in, how the processes are working out. So thank you for highlighting that for us. Anything else, Chris and Danielle, you want to add? Are you going to address the security audit and the FOIA dashboard? So um, for the security audit, I think um, I, I would love to be able to speak with our security office to understand more about the type of audit that they are doing. Um, maybe we can go in to do some kind of like quarterly check-in or some kind of like um, review independently to assess the process that we can, sorry that I, I missed that, that we can, we will definitely follow up on that one. And with related to um, the other one is the foyer the dashboard, thank you. Um, and I'm wondering if I saw um, Ms. Lloyd is here and, um, and, and Dr. Ivy, th this may be a little bit more from an operational perspective about how we manage it and also keep the school board on top of what's happening. So I would like to defer to management to respond. Yeah, so thank you for that question. We have a lot of data on FOIA. We keep um, a track of every single request that comes in, uh, the date that it's delivered, and um, the number of pages as well, although that is actually a new addition to our database. We weren't keeping that um, prior to, I believe, like a, a few months ago. Um, we are watching those trend lines, and those trend lines do need to be posted. They've already been shared, I believe, with the board in uh, the data that we shared with you back in February. So you can see where our trend line is going. I have that data. If not, I will actually package for you and make sure I reshare so that you've got that data as well. Um, we are seeing a large increase in FOIA numbers, and we are able to track that data. In terms of the dashboard, I'm producing a dashboard right now. I think this is something that we could look at when we uh, create a records, public records office, which we're looking to do July, starting July 1. Once we've hired those positions in, I think we'll have a little more bandwidth. Right now, we have one FOIA officer for the entire district. She's working round the clock. She's the only person able to do redactions. So I do know that the last few weekends, she's been working both Saturday and Sunday and late into the evenings as well to make sure that we are completing that. Even with our reorganization, we will have her as a, we will have a records officer manager potentially, but that FOIA office a role will be realigned into the public records office manager role. So we are not actually increasing a FOIA officer position in that reorganization. We are only increasing an analyst, which is at a lower level and able to provide a support role. Once we do have those positions in place, oh sorry, the other additions will be to, to include FERPA. 
in that public uh, records office, um, office so that we are then aligning the FERPA and the FOIA office processes um, to better align, to better be deli deliver, and also to be ensuring accountability as well. That does not mean that we're necessarily increasing those positions, even though it looks like we've got an increase in that budget. Dashboard-wise, I can definitely promise something publicly once we've got those positions in place. Right now, our FOIA officer needs to be working around the clock to make sure we're delivering on the requests that are coming in and that we're complying. FOIA timeline is incredibly tight in terms of delivery, and so um, we need to make sure we're right on, we're, we're, we're meeting those delivery timelines as much as possible. That's our priority. Thank you for responding that way. I would just encourage that the more we put out there about how much of our resources are going to this area, um, I think it's critical because we are happy we all embrace transparency, but every time that we spend additional resources in this area to meet increased demands uh, set by the legislature, then it takes money away from serving our students directly. Um, because Dr. Brayburn isn't here right now, I would just like, oh, there he is. Hi, <laughs> Dr. Sorry, sorry. I, um, to follow up on the security audit question, our security review, I had just happened to have a conversation yesterday with Tom Vaccarello and with Dr. Brabran on where is that and how are we moving forward. Um, so Dr. Brabran, I don't know if you want to fill everyone in on what we talked about, but mainly I think our interim assistant superintendent for facilities once that person is on board, we need to have the whole discussion about what is it really, what do we want, how independent, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, and we have Mr. Smith here. <clears throat> we're certainly um, we're certainly well aware of the transition that we're about to make with Mr. Plattenberg leaving, and, and Mr. Smith will be providing an update to the board very soon around uh, our transition. Uh, we do plan to have an interim named, of course, before Mr. Plattenberg leaves. Yes, and we are actively going to uh, move forward, and unfortunately, every one of these times that there is a tragedy, we relook and reassess to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep our schools safe and secure, and there'll be some additional items that we're going to look at as the board directed us to do in the follow-on. Uh, Mr. Smith, anything you want to add to that? Uh, no, other than, again, that we will be taking a look at this at, uh, with our year-end uh, recommendation for the board, uh, where we'll have uh, a recommendation for an overall assessment. Where we not only look at our essential uh, assessment, but look at safety and security at a school-by-school -school level. Um, I Just for logistics, it is on now 12.30. And we do have um, outside counsel coming in for our, our closed session at 12.30. So, and we've got three at least board members that would like to speak. Um, I think we have options of either having people speak. We're gonna be a few minutes late for the council. I don't know what your availability is after, if we, if we took a break, did our closed session, could we come back to the audit topic? Sure. Um, right now, when I you? see uh, Ms. Uh, Elaine, is it a bra has a question and I've Megan a has bra, a go Rajna, back? And Laura Jane Cohen. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I cannot see yeah. on my back. Um, yeah, sure. Are you sure? Does that. Ms. Sullen, do you maybe. Do we want to try allocating just 10 minutes and I, we can go and try to um, let council know we'll be 10 minutes late? I think if we go over 10 minutes, we'll have to probably come back together. I don't need answers, Ms. Okay. I'll All do right. that. Let's try Thank that. you. All right. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Amesh, followed by Ms. seismer -Heiser. All right. Um, thank you, Ms. Co. as always, and uh, Ms. Moore, Mr. Migliaccio. Uh, thank you all for your work. Uh, on this. Um, so I just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, I did notice you were responsive to a number of the questions, so I do appreciate that and want to acknowledge it uh, from the meeting. Just in terms of the SRPs, so I just want to clarify, and I know, um, you know, Ms. Tolan and Ms. Ko, you were diligent about this, so I do appreciate that and want to just name it. Um, but just to clarify kind of 
I know we talked about the timeline of where we are and staff have already done some work uh, to arrive at where we um, are today that we could have discussed, but I guess is outside of the scope of today's conversation. Um, can you just update us on, on what that can look like? And I, I'm wondering if that can be delineated even in the report, just in terms of those check-ins of when um, we're going to receive updates on, on what you're finding as we're moving along, just so that it's incorporated in that iterative feedback process. I know you know my question already, but yeah, if you can please speak to that a little bit. So if, if I may, I brought to speak about that. So we have already finished our first a review on the SO3 funding, and we have uh, we were planning to share with the audit committee last month, but um, the meeting was cancelled. So we will be sharing the result with the audit committee in June. Um, so if I may, just at a very high level, to kind of talks about the key points. That number one is we looked at about eight million dollars only because we only looking back right for audit, and then out of the um, is it eight or four? Sorry, a correction is four millions. And then out of the four million, when we looked at the processes, the check and balances, um, they are actually uh, pretty good, well done. And we did observe three different observations from the first review. They are um, looking at the hourly rate that we uh, assigned for like certain additional jobs because of COVID, uh, some of the rate that we checked were not consistent, like were not that what it should be based upon the actual nature of the work that the employee performed. The second uh, item we, we observe and, uh, and we believe is likely because of clerical error, unintentional uh, errors, is that the, the time range uh, on some of the extra duty agreements that we signed with our staff members, the, the time range is off. Like, for example, that, that it is from uh, uh, July 1, 2022 to, to June 30th, 2022. So we know it's, off, it's, it's un, intentional clerical mistakes, but a contract is a contract. So we highlighted that for management. Thirdly, it's more about the operating effectiveness, meaning that when we looked at the documents, they are not quite in one repository yet. And again, I mean, it, we are still starting getting the using this fund. So when we ask for support, they may be reciting the supporting documents in like, I'm just um, picking a number, like four different locations. So we suggest to the management that, that if in the future, if those documents can reside in the same place, so when the uh, federal agency or external auditors come that you can just pull it up and show it to them, it will be uh, making the audit process uh, uh, more efficient. So these are the three high lights. And uh, like your suggestion uh, abroad, that we definitely took into account of the learning from this three observation, and we will build upon that, and then to further uh, like improve our continuous monitoring. We are planning to look at it again in a few months to see how things are going on. So, so that's my commitment to the school board, that we will take what we learn, and then it will be an it, iterative process to put it back in our continuous monitoring. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and is this, uh, uh, sorry, is this a representative sampling, the four million, or is that kind of a certain region, certain set of schools? Yeah. Um, that would be the total population of what was spent during our audit scope period, which I think was. Oh, that's um, the total. Yeah, that's the total expenditure um, amount. Um, from July 1st, 2021 through January 31st, 2022. And we looked at a sample of that. I think that may be, may be uh, a broad question. And I think we looked at, is it a, about 10%? Um, we looked at 50 transactions, which totaled um, almost 400,000. So about 10% of the total population, and we are looking on expanding that. If if you all are interested to know about the audit process, we use a stratified, you know, random sampling, meaning we put the, 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 the expenditures in different nature of expenditures, and then we selected our representative sample from each category. Yeah, no, that's helpful because, I mean, we're dealing with, like, over 188 million, right? So it's a small, small subset. Um, but I know that that's also just what's been spent up to this point. So then the question, that, the next question goes to staff of where that information is being applied, right? So this is, these are key findings, three uh, errors, mistakes, you know, whatever, improvements, areas of improvement that have been identified already in how the ESSER money is being deployed, used, et cetera. Um, 
then what? I don't know, everybody's looking over here, so. <laughs> <laughs> so. I mean, we always appreciate the Auditor General's Office's findings and we try to act on those as, you know, um, it, as urgently as possible. Um, you know, I'm trying to, to recall what those three findings were, to be honest with you. So whether or not they've been incorporated into practice yet or not, I'd have to get back to you on that to give you a precise answer. This is, though, this is the project management team we've set up for ESSER. Uh, ESSER. So when Esther and the Auditor General's office gives us the feedback, we're going to take that back to the project management team and put those in, again, one's a clerical error, one's about the rates of pay, making sure there's consistency. You've heard that before anyway in our schools about paying people the right rate of pay. But we're going to take that feedback and use it, and we're going to do that continuously as they give us the feedback through, um, through all their audit work they're going to do. Okay. So I'll be glad to provide an update where we are on this before my departure. Okay, can you remind me where we are in, in our, on the other side of the program evaluation timetable? Because I know we, bro we broke it up into two pieces, right? There's like the ORC, our own internal iterative process, and then the compliance piece that they're covering. Yeah, so ORC is preparing um, their second report to the board. The last report that the board received was in February of 2022. So they're preparing their second report that will be um, available shortly. We're still waiting for the final end of the year academic information to come in, but they're working on that second report now. Okay, is that coming back in a work session uh, before the end of the year? It, it, it is in <laughs> the queue uh, to be scheduled for a future work session. I can't tell you when exactly um, that will happen yet, though. Okay, because I mean, it might be useless if we end up looking at it in the fall. You know, that's something, you know, Rashna Stella, I think we really need to have that before the end of, before recess, because otherwise, how is it going to inform the next stage of the ESSER work, right? And ideally, I, I, we would hear about this part, the implementation of what's, what's right. going to change. We can yeah. coordinate with Dr. Reed about when the board gets it. I think the other issue is when you schedule a work session. We can get you that as soon as it's complete. Something I think it's already been said, I think Ms. Mayor and other members spoke to it. One of the priorities the board is going to have is to prioritize the work with the new superintendent and what's gonna be first. You're gonna have a host of things and I, I think that's important work that I know you all will be able to do, but uh, we can get this to you no matter what, separate from a work session and have the document in your hand sometime over the summer when it's complete. Right. I mean, I guess what I'm invested in, and I'm hearing the kind of the caution, but I'm invested in that feedback then informing the work, because otherwise there's no point so, of investing this time uh, into it. Uh, yeah. So I will add that the, the information that we receive from ORC and, and all of our data points that we receive con uh, continuously informs the work. And so as we think about when we're going to bring that information back to the board, uh, our project management team, our instructional team, they will be taking that information and working, be working very closely with principals and our teams in our schools based on the data that we get here at the end of the year. So it's not as if we sit on data that we receive and wait for uh, the board to review it before we take actions on it. So we will be using that information all summer long uh, and then of course be providing uh, an update to the board so that we can get guidance moving forward. But uh, but I, I wouldn't want anyone to, to no, think no, for that sure, for sure. we wouldn't be using that, that data uh, internally. Right, right. Um, Esther, Ms. Co, do you have recommendations that come out of the, even preliminarily for these three pieces or? So uh, like I started off with the remarks about that this um, report is supposed to be discussed with the audit committee in May, but because it was canceled, so is now what we'll be discussing on June 22nd with the audit committee. I do believe that we included suggestions and recommendations in the report. And at that time, we will have more dialogues with the audit committee and management as to exactly what um, improvement can be made. But I do believe that we propose recommendations in the memorandum okay so mr. Smith I think this is the piece I'm trying to link like they're gonna have a presentation in June on the audit side of improvements with recommendations right ideally we have that be folded in in advance of uh, that's my time but 
in advance of the next stage of when we reset, right? We're going to take the feedback, reset, and then apply. But before that next stage of application, ideally this would be folded in. Right? Well, the compliance pieces happen on a regular uh, schedule, and the, again, it provides information to us as we're working through. We we do have to wait until the end of the year before the the data student data is back and scrubbed before we can take that data and then make recommendations for the following year. So there's a timing piece to that. The pieces that that Ms. Coe's team have been engaged with with regard to compliance, uh, we've actually reviewed the report and been able to respond. Uh, and are looking at, at a lot of those recommendations currently. So uh, again, it's the piece of uh, how the data are used internally, how it's then presented to the board. We take any additional guidance that the board might provide, um, but we do use that data internally. And then uh, in a sense, it's not necessarily off cycle, but it's that then at the end of the year, we'll get the student data and be able to inform our work based on our, our student outcomes. We'll start to work on that internally and then bring that to the board uh, to, to update the board and the community. It's my time, but hopefully others can pick it up. Thank well, you. I would just like to just say quickly that that is really the, what happens in the audit committee meetings is we get the results, management is there to talk about what they're doing, what the recommendations are, how they're implementing it, and it is monitored monthly by the audit committee. Just briefly, um, two things, and I don't need a lot of responses. I just wanted to point that out. Ms. Cohen, I know you and I talked about knowledge management and knowledge transfer and the piece of that around the um, succession plan and leadership plan. Um, and I just wanted to make sure to flag that to, as we're looking at succession planning, it's not just making sure we have leaders in place right to take over the work, but we have a, a clear defined process for knowledge management as well as knowledge transfer. So the knowledge of some of our longtime staff members are also consistently transferred um, as they transfer those leadership roles. So I just wanted to put that that out there to make sure that's part of that audit to have that in place. Uh, I don't need a response because I'm trying to um, be mindful of time. And the last thing I wanted just to ask on the um, the audit of the, of the legal counsel, and we talked specifically about FOIA and the concerns about FOIA, um, I know that the results of that audit may not be subject to FOIA because of the audit of the legal counsel, but is there a way to have a discussion about some of the FOIA concerns in a public forum so our public can be aware of some of the um, realities of what's happening with FOIA these days. So just something to put out for you to think about as you structure that piece of the audit. Again, I don't need a response now, but I do think it's important for some of what you find if it relates to FOIA and the implications that it has on our, um, on our offices to be able to be discussed in public. Oh, sorry, Ms. Cohen. Thanks so much. Um, Thank you so much, Ms. Co and your team. You guys are amazing as always. Um, I just wanted to highlight, um, Ms. Co, what you said about the employee evaluation um, audit and just really, really say how important I think it is that we do that audit this year um, in preparation exactly for collective bargaining. The process that we have in place for our operational employees is not remotely the same as our, um, you know, teaching um, employees. And so I just want to make sure that before we go into collective bargaining, we should know A, you know, what we're doing. Um, B, are we doing what we're doing with fidelity? And C, if we've benchmarked what other systems are doing um, as the best employee um, evaluation method. There are other systems that do peer-to-peer -peer review. Um, there's a whole handful of methods that have come to, you know, light in the last 10 years or so that are potentially a better way of, of um, handling employee evaluation. I would think that it's kind of key with a new HR person and a new superintendent coming in um, to have that evaluation. So I just wanted to make sure that I was a voice in the room for supporting that going forward. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Ms. McLaughlin, you have your placard up. Did you want to go back? Please. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, really quickly um, to what uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders said, I can't emphasize enough. I think we absolutely need a FOIA dashboard. Um, there's, you know, we've talked about this is changing the landscape, local, state, national. 
uh, our public needs to understand how much it's grown. Number two, um, board members, you may have seen I sent an email out to the superintendent and our um, legislative lobbyist, Michael Malloy, um, and our um, general counsel, John Foster. We absolutely need to have on our legislative package um, legislation that addresses uh, the volume and scope of FOIAs. Um, it, it can't be a one-size-fits-all when some requests are thousands of pages and require redactions because of legal requirements. It's just, it's not based in reality. So there's no question this board and the superintendent and his team are geared toward transparency, but it also has to be realistic. And, and we can't be putting ourselves into this situation where the public loses trust and we don't want them to lose trust. So we need to have that being reasonable. Um, and then, you know, the only other thing that, um, you know, I just wanted to put a fine point on um, with the role of the OAG. Um, you know, I fought extremely hard on this. We had staff make recommendations if we were gonna have an inspector general or an auditor general. And we were advised at the time to go with the auditor general. And at times I've been concerned that then as a result, we don't do things holistically, like the ombudsman's office is meant to be independent too. And I credit that be a great legacy of Dr. Brabrands. You brought the ombudsman in when I championed and so many other board members did, and you led on that. But I think, you know, with our audit, our ombudsman having retired, I think that with the new superintendent, we need to look at where does that get housed. So I wanted to just make those go back points. Thank you. Okay, uh, did you have any additional comments? Dr. Braver? No, I don't. All right, that um, concludes board comments. Um, unfortunately, there is an audit committee meeting next week. So, um, I, I think the only kind of topic open was the um, project management and, you know, wh where that can fit in with what we're doing or, you know, that may be a discussion to have with the audit committee next week. Do we want to put that on for the following fiscal year? How do we discuss that with um, Dr. Reed um, and have that discussion moving forward? So that seemed to be the big open topic. Ms. Bukarski? Yeah, actually, that's exactly one. I, people ask to move this so you have time um, till the last meeting in June. Yes, it, we're not voting on this yep. this week. We have another um, week and a half to work yep. on this, or two weeks um, to finalize this and vote on June 30th. All right, thank you, everyone. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Esther, thank you. Chris. Thank you. Danielle. All right, Danielle. folks, if we can hustle, we're, we're behind. We have people waiting for us. Do you, do, you, do you need to make a motion to go and close? Yeah, I did, but I don't have that motion. Okay. We, uh, in order to comply with section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it's necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County Public School Board convened a closed meeting on June 14th, 2022, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion Convening the close were discussed, heard, or considered by the board during the close. Moved by Dr. Anderson, seconded by Ms. Omesh. All those in favor? All right, that's unanimous. Um, we do for our public, um, unfortunately, because we had a, an urgent matter come up today, we'll have to 
rearrange our agenda a bit. We will be rescheduling the goal three and four reports to another work session. We will be discussing the SRNR right now because it is slated for a vote this coming Thursday. And with that, um, Ms. Keys Gamar and Ms. McLaughlin. Yes, we do thank everyone for their patience. Uh, we're going to begin our discussion on the SRNR forthwith. Uh, Dr. Boyd. Good afternoon. So again, I'm Michelle Boyd, Assistant Superintendent for Special Services. And joining me today um, is Dr. Shannon Anderson, Coordinator for Equity and Student Conduct, and Vijay Rao, Director of Cybersecurity. Um, and we'll move very briskly, and then um, certainly we can take any questions that you might have. April 14th, we presented the draft revisions to the SRNR that were informed by legislative changes and feedback from stakeholders. <clears throat> Following our April 14th school board work session, additional stakeholder engagement ensued with staff, students, board members, community members, advisory committees, and parent teacher organizations through work groups, community forums, and surveys. Stakeholder experience, legislation, and FCPS policies and regulations informed feedback received during the review process. Significant changes, significant updates to the SRNR draft following the April 14th school board work session rests within six categories. Cell phones, student rights, student behavior and administrative response table, also referred to as the SBAR chart, mandatory police reporting, glossary, and our acceptable <coughs> use policy regulation. And looking at cell phones, five items were added to clarify expectations to the cell phone expectations and to clarify the level of response for cell phone violations. More specifically, the following was added to the SRNR draft. Accommodation requests for use of personally owned devices as an accommodation will be considered by students' respective multidisciplinary teams, such as the IEP team, 504 committee, English language committee, and that is applicable for all grade levels. Use of cell phones in restrooms and lockers, locker rooms are prohibited for all grade levels unless there's a medical necessity or emergency. Watches that serve a dual purpose, such as smart watches, have to, be, have, to have their phone features off when cell phone use is prohibited for all grade levels. Cell phone violations are limited to level one and level two violations. And last but not least, exclusionary practices are prohibited for cell phone violations. And looking at our second category where significant changes were made was to the students' rights and students' responsibility sections. Revisions in this section were primarily incorporated to better reflect the overarching intent of federal legislation or other FCPS policies and regulations. Specifically, the following revisions were made. We added a right to equitable access to the learning environment, educational materials, and extracurricular activities and the right to equal opportunity section. We added the right to have personally identifiable information and citizenship or immigration status protected from unauthorized sharing and the rights of equal opportunity section. And we revised the language within the responsibility for a Pledge of Allegiance and Moment of Silence to better reflect students and parents right to choose to participate. And the next category of change is regarding the student behavior and administrative response table, commonly referred to as the SBAR chart. Specifically, examples of discriminatory harassment were added to the SBAR code BSC8, and referrals to an IEP team or local screening committee were added as to the intervention example list for level two infractions. Additionally, the proposed change um, of infractions for currently for items that are currently listed as K6 to K3 was rescinded so that the draft was converted back to mirror the existing delineation as it appears in the 21-22 SRNR. Finally, Title I codes have been moved into a separate standalone SBAR chart to clearly delineate Title IX infractions. And I think I may have said Title I, I meant Title IX. Title IX infractions. Our fourth category where we had substantive changes is regarding mandatory reporting to law enforcement, which was updated to reflect the passing of House Bill 4. 
Currently, mandatory reporting to law enforcement is limited to enumerated acts, which may, quote unquote, constitute a felony. Under the new law, school principals will be required to report law enforce to law enforcement certain enumerated acts which may constitute a misdemeanor offense in addition to certain enumerated acts which may constitute a felony. Details of those enumerated acts for reporting to law enforcement that is mandatory is outlined on pages 46 and 47 of the SRNR for your review. <clears throat> the fifth category of revisions is relative to terms added to the glossary and that was done for clarity. The seven terms listed on the screen that appear in the narrative of the SRNR were added to the glossary. The final category where substantive change was made was relative to the acceptable use policy regulation. While the acceptable use policy regulation is a distinct regulation from the SRNR, the content included in the acceptable use policy regulation heavily influences content in the SRNR, specifically as it relates to the use of FCPS issued devices, software, and internet, to name a few. As a result, some changes to the acceptable use policy regulation are referenced in the body of the SRNR. Examples of key changes to the acceptable use policy regulation since the last draft was shared with you on April 14th include the following. Use of social media is permitted during school hours when it's permitted by administration and use of social media must be limited to academic activities. Recording of instructional programs in the classroom environment generally is prohibited. Recording of conversations with school officials is prohibited without the official's advanced permission to do so. And finally, the use of tablets, phones, or other <coughs> tablets, phones, or other mobile devices in restrooms and locker rooms is prohibited, again, unless there's a medical necessity or emergency. Um, additionally, a detailed account of changes to Regulation 6410 um, is uploaded on board docs for your review. Finally, we just want to once again thank um, the numerous stakeholders who engaged with us and provided feedback through this process. That serves as a um, it really a, a value added to us that we just really can't quantify. So we just want to take the time and thank those persons um, that took time out of their day to give us feedback, whether written or verbal, um, to help us enhance our SRNR and to make it a better uh, document each and every year. And at this time, I turn it back over to uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Um, did, you, did you did you have an opportunity to introduce the pe young person? I did it very fast. You, oh, it was real fast. <laughs> I missed it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so far, we have uh, Dr. Anderson and then Ms. Uh, Karen Corbett Sanders. Thank you. I do want to say thank you, first of all, for putting together the stakeholder. Um, communication, the, the virtual town halls and the surveys. I think that was very helpful in this process. It's definitely a huge improvement. <clears throat> and I like the fact that we've been able to get so uh, many um, responses. Were you going to go over this in any way? I was not um, just due to our time um, okay. and that we posted it, but certainly if there's anything that you want me to address, I'm happy to do so. Okay, I, I'll just come back to this and I'll just start my first round of questions on um, the document itself. Um, thank you for adding the restroom and the lockers language that was missing and I don't even think we realize it was missing, but that's a piece where our kids often struggle when there's the use of cell phones and recording them in various states. Um, so thank you for that. On page 18 of the um, document, I think numbers one and two, uh, this is, this, this document, not the PowerPoint. Um, you talked about cell phone usage for sixth grade students, letter O, numbers one and two. Um, number one talks about sixth grade students and number two, seventh and eighth grade students. I thank you for noting the differences between the sixth graders at Paul Holmes and Glasgow. But here, <coughs> we have those three schools managing two different sets of expectations for students. What feedback did the principals give about that in terms of its feasibility? So as we talked with all of our middle school principals, we had the most engagement with them. Um, the majority had consensus around the proposal. Um, and folks generally understand that we want to make sure that there are not different expectations for students based on their zip code. And so that was the impetus really for um, changing. In the first draft, I believe it was listed as elementary, middle, and high, but to clarify that there would be um, grade level 
um, expectations that were consistent across the county. And so we realized that those three schools, as well as our, <clears throat> excuse me, three secondary schools, um, do have some unique challenges where they have uh, more grade levels in one space. And we will be working closely with those principals to provide any support and suggestions that they might need to facilitate the effective implementation of these expectations. Sure, and I appreciate the fact that you got the feedback of all of the principals, but I'm particularly concerned of getting the feedback of the impacted principals because their staff will have to navigate two sets of rules, and that can be burdensome, plus all of the other things that we want them to do. So I would love to have that feedback before um, maybe Tuesday. Certainly. And I'm happy to reach out to my three if you think that would be helpful. So we can reach out. Um, again, we'd work through the association, but we'll reach out directly to those um, specific principals. Thank you. Um, on page 23, you also made some changes to cell phones so that there are level one and two infractions. I think that's appropriate for where we are right now, definitely, because I, I, I think I raised this, and as did many others, we did not want our staff to turn into the cell phone police. And for it to be elevated in this way, I, I, I don't think would have benefited us. Um, one of the things that you mentioned, I believe this is the PowerPoint now, page 10, um, The use of social media, PowerPoint page 10. You know, we just came from graduation season where we saw a lot of discrepancies in terms of how some schools allowed kids to um, decorate their mortarboards and some schools did not. So this is kind of also very fresh for me. Can you give me an example of why, because it said only for academic um, activities. What would be an example that a school would want for students to engage in social media that is an academic activity? So if they were promoting a, if they were promoting a science fair or um, different projects that they might be doing or an upcoming event that was being hosted a PTA, you know, night, math night, those type of things, we really want, <clears throat> excuse me, and when we say academic activities, we're really talking about, you know, a holistic instructional program. So whether it's with the performing arts, you know, math, reading, writing, those type of things to delineate between, um, I'm just posting the picture of, you know, me and Megan for a random reason on social media. Maybe Megan has consented or she has not. Um, those type of things. And again, we know we'll have to get feedback as we go through this process because these are new expectations, but we really want to limit the use of social media during the school day to really be focused on instruction um, and teaching and learning. No, I'm in full agreement with that part. I just am concerned about the piece where it is dependent on the school's administration to make that determination. I'm struggling with seeing how that can be consistently applied across our division. And I'm still struggling to see what the students, and I, you know, I hear with band, et cetera, but I'm still struggling to hear what would be necessary for students to um, advertise for band or those other activities during school time. Yeah, yeah, and we'll, we'll monitor that. We certainly do hear your feedback. Um, <clears throat> during this process, we received um, different views and different lenses. Initially, we were very stringent but did want to um, make some exceptions or consideration for times where it would be appropriate. So again, this will be one of the things where we have to engage in ongoing feedback and if we have to make adjustments or through professional development, uh, working through the region office to make sure they're more clear in terms of expectations. Um, because we know whenever we do an exception, there's always room for that exception to become the rule and it becomes something else, that evolution. Um, so we'll be closely monitoring it, but you know, I. I I'm certain we would have to engage and re-engage with staff um, as we work our implementation hiccups. Well, I've run out of time, but I've got other comments. Go Thank back. you. Do you do you want to go back? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, next, we have Ms. Karen Corbett Sanders, and then Ms. Laura Jane Cohen. And I don't. I apologize. Um, I'm sorry. Go Mr. ahead. Mr. Vijay wanted to add something. Oh, please, sir. So uh, I wanted to also add some context. Uh, before it even gets to the administration, the Office of Cybersecurity would have to approve the social media platform. Oh, okay. So some of the most egregious issues we have seen over the past year, like Instagram, TikTok, and so on, would not be allowed, period. So we're really talking about approved social media sites, uh, which don't have, uh, you know, the broad safety and security issues that we've been dealing with, like Facebook, Twitter, and so on, where at least some schools are actually using it. Uh, they could be a group or w what have you. So uh, I, I think, yes, the administration has to allow it, but within the AUP, there's also another line which says that Office of Cybersecurity needs to approve 
sites and uh, as social media or regular sites. Uh, so it's like a two-step process. So it's not all up to the school administration. It's not like the school administration can suddenly approve like Snapchat uh, because, they, uh, you know, so there's layers to it. I just wanted to add that context. Okay, thank you. I assume somebody will explain the professional development that goes along with that at some point. <laughs> All right, uh, uh, Ms. Cor Car Ms. Corbett Sanders, and then we have uh, Ms. Laura Jane Cohen. First, I want to thank you all for being here today and taking very seriously all of the concerns and questions that many of us raised at the last work session. Uh, the bathroom issue and the use of cell phones was raised there, and I appreciate it. I also want to have a personal thank you to you, Mr. Rao, because of your leadership in the cybersecurity area and dealing with some of the social media challenges that we've faced at many of our middle and high schools in the past year. It is greatly appreciated, and I know that my community is grateful for your work. Um, I do have... It's true. I do have a couple of questions. Um, one regarding the recording of uh, conversations. I believe the state of Virginia is a single uh, approver state. And so this seems to, to uh, undermine that. Can you address that, please? Recording conversations. Yeah, I, I think from a cybersecurity perspective, just recording. Even whether it's recording, you know, your. No, I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, the question is that under state code, I believe it only is a single consent. So uh, I was going to have uh, Mr. Foster speak to that specifically. Um, are you ready? Okay. Sure. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Keys Kamara. So, um, yes, it is correct that Virginia is a single um, consent state. Um, there are um, unique and very important concerns for K-12 school systems, including um, confidential student information, um, and that is under FERPA, um, that is separate and apart from the Virginia statute that um, Ms. Corbett Sanders mentioned. And so I, um, I, I, I uh, don't want to speak for Mr. Rao, but I, I do know that that is one concern um, in wanting to limit the recording of um, things that are happening at school. I'm fine with it. I just think we need a footnote so that we're able to answer those questions when people say, but this is my right. Um, similarly, I am very appreciative of the language that has been added to section uh, category D uh, regarding um, malicious dead naming. Um, I would suggest that that probably needs to be defined in our, the term malicious needs to be defined. And while we're doing that under misgendering, there is, uh, that definition needs to be looked at as well because it doesn't tie neatly to the malicious intent. And that's on page 69. So if we could add those two, that would be great. Um, and then on 69 and Dr. Board, I'm just looking to the, which word are you looking at on 69? I know it's all those definitions. So under misgendering, mm -hmm. it says or accidentally. The act of labeling Deliberately with or gender. accidentally. Right. And it's you're easy. saying malicious doesn't fit with accidental? Right. Correct. So I think what ha what's happening, the, the definition of misgendering is there, generally speaking, but once we add the definition of malicious, when you look at the phrase together collectively, excuse me, 
collectively to say malicious misgendering. So putting what the definition is, it's the malicious with it. Um, but we just pulled the exact definition. And so that accidentally piece is just part and parcel of the more broad term. But for our application, we're talking about when you maliciously <coughs> use the, in a, in a pro, or the non-preferred um, term. I so under, we'll work with that, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 so I think, I think I know where this is. What you'd probably prefer is the definition malicious, malicious misgendering and then just remove accidentally. And then we're saying this is the deliberate act of labeling others with well, I would actually give a separate definition of malicious because if you look at the language in B, it actually uh, uses the term malicious in multiple areas. So I do think that we need to be very clear because I've had people say, well, how do you know I'm being malicious? So I All would right, just... let, we'll take that feedback back. That's helpful. Okay, and then the last um, has nothing to do with the SR&R, but it does have to do with the... Um, uh, with what we share with outside parties uh, as a result of legislative action at the state. And at some point, we probably need to uh, revisit that language because it, uh, when we're talking about misdemeanors, we don't want to create criminal records for kids that don't need to be created. We instead want restorative justice. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Uh, did you. you want to say something? Okay. I was just saying thank you. Uh, Ms. Uh, Laura Jane Cohen. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, just a few things. Um, you know, I know that I have been beating a dead horse about us using the term parent, and I recognize there's a definition of it. But we worked for so long to say, to add parent or guardian into our language that I know it makes the document longer, but we have so many students for whom a biological parent is not um, who's going to show up. And, and my fear is when I read, especially when talking about parents' responsibilities and rights when it comes to discipline processes, that the way that we've written it is not inclusive. If I am an aunt who's the custodial guardian for my niece, um, it's not necessarily clear to me that I have a right um, to be notified, you know, if she's been brought into the office. So um, I know I've lodged that several times. I will just take the opportunity to lodge it once more. Um, with secondary schools, with the difference between middle school and high school, and I do want to thank you. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself. Thank you so much for continuing to work on the cell phone policy. I know so many of us have been absolute pains in the tush about it, but it's so important that we get it right. And I know so many of us went back to talk to our principals and make sure that we were helping to capture um, what their intent was. And so changing it to just a level one and two infraction, I so appreciate it. Um, so I apologize for skipping over my, my sincere thanks for working so hard on getting this right. Um, You're welcome, Ms. Cohen. We, we <laughs> did go back and talk to the whole team about that, and, and I do want to applaud Dr. Boyd for that as well. Thank you. Well, if the point is that we want to make sure that kids are not are engaging, which is what cell phones are keeping them from doing, it makes no sense to me that we would then wind up putting them out of school where they can't engage. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that change. Um, but I was hoping that we could address that um, the question in secondary schools. Right now, middle school is written that passing periods and lunches, you would not be able to use your phone. But at a school like Lake Braddock, we have a lot of middle school kids who are accessing high school lunches and everybody's all mixed together. So I'm just concerned from an administrative point of view, how on earth are you going to enforce that? Thank you, Ms. Cohen. And so we will, um, we've had some conversations and we'll continue to have some conversations about different ideas that can be utilized um, for those schools, similar to what um, Dr. Anderson was referring to um, for our schools where we have, you know, sixth graders um, with seventh and eighth, et cetera, um, on different ways that they can do that, that that would work for them. We know that we spoke to, you know, Dr. Herring shared some of the things with a small group 
um, some of the strategies that they're currently using because they're currently implementing this practice. And I know that, you know, his school is certainly different from some others. Um, but I think as, as we work together as thought partners that we certainly can come up with something. And again, it's just assuming positive intent, looking at the unique school to see what system or strategy will work with our few schools that are um, structurally different from the majority. And I think just allowing those principals some discretion about if, if at a secondary school, high school rules need to apply just as we do with start time and um, all of that, like we may need to make some accommodation because I don't want our administration, you know, stuck in trying to track down, oh wait, that's a middle schooler who's at a high school lunch period and he has his phone out, like that sort of defeats the purpose to me. Um, the last thing is on page 60, um, D4, where it references um, intellectual students with intellectual disabilities. I am still really struggling with this provided notice. I don't understand how we can take a written or verbal statement from a student with intellectual disabilities without ensuring, without parent consent. I don't, so if somebody could walk me through that, I have to say that's such a stickler to me that I, it, I would struggle to, to vote for this. So, so thank you again um, for that question. And we did receive this question during the engagement process. Um, as school principals are conducting investigations, getting feedback um, is critically important, whether it's from a student that's engaged in the, um, acts, in the incident or someone who's observed the incident so that folks would have the appropriate information um, to take the appropriate course of action. Um, we encourage that, and even in the language now, is that um, really um, taking best efforts to contact the parent to inform them um, of the need that, you know, Little Sloan, for example, um, needs to be questioned. Um, but while we would, if we would change that to um, a parent having to consent in advance, that could impede the investigation process. Um, and also another piece, we know that there's certainly just based off the definition of a disability category, there's certain things that we know if somebody qualifies as, an, as having an intellectual disability, we know that there's um, needs with adaptive behavior and cognitive functioning. Um, but to just to, to have something different for just that one classification um, of students, there could be a number of needs with a number of our students, with our English language learners, for example, there could be language barriers even with the uh, interpretation. We have some students who have learning disabilities who have cognitive functioning at the level of some of our students with intellectual uh, disabilities, but they don't have the adaptive behavior challenges. We have students with autism that due to, due to, their, uh, due to their significant communication needs and or just perceptions have different needs. And so I use all of those examples to say that um, I think we put ourselves in a precarious place when we begin to call out one disability category versus another. And I think that, you know, if we were to require consent for any student, that we could um, potentially be impeding the investigation process. Um, and certainly while some of the things are smaller in nature, that might, um, when applied across the board, might prove to be a significant barrier um, well, across the board. Yeah. So that's some of the things that we just discussed. Ms. Ms. No, I, Ms. I know that I'm out of time, Ms. Keys Gamara, but I wonder if you might give me a second to just respond to that or if you well, feel like I have to wait because for back. I think there may be a mis... If you would let Dr. Braybrand clarify, because the language actually says something a little bit different than the discussion, so... Ms. You, Cohen, I, maybe it's just double-checking the page, because at page 60, D4, it says a disciplinary incident involving a student with an intellectual developmental disability, uh, it talks about... Um, that uh, that will not have a verbal or written statement from the student until a parent has been provided notice. Right, but we've argued several times, A, this is about sus behavior that can be suspended, um, so not just investigation of, of something that a kid witnessed, but also um, that this is provided notice, and I think this board has multiple times argued that notice can mean I left a, you a voicemail and so I have the right to have your child make a statement. And I think in reference to the categories that Dr. Boyd gave, I would argue that those parents should have to give consent before we take a, note, a, a verbal or written statement from them too, so. And, so, and I think what Dr. Boyd is saying on consent, that may impede the administrator's ability to real time get information about a case that may that may have safety implications for the school. Um, 
I think that's why we've left the language as notice as opposed to consent. Um, you know, I know to Ms. Cullen's point, this is something that I believe um, is even reflected in our questions from the ACSD where I believe we provided a narrative response to that effect. And so um, I do want you to know that we heavily consider, you know, many facets um, of this, but as we think about these things, and I know the intent um, of which, in the spirit in which everyone is coming at this from, but we have to think about, is this something that can be applied across every situation, every school, every scenario? And as you begin to do that, um, you know, and I don't want to go gloom and doom, but there's a number of huge pieces that could happen. And if we say consent, if we put that in there, we could be putting ourselves in, in a pretty tight space when we're trying to create a safe learning environment for kids and also for staff. Okay. Do Ms. Keys, come on, may I have a go, Bambi place on go back? Yes, ma'am. Thank right. you. Okay, thank you. Um, Next, we have uh, Mr. Frisch, and the next person after that is Ms. Omesh, and I don't have anybody else after that. Rachna. Rachna, okay. Just as a uh, top line, the community engagement information that was shared with us, parents support the changes, and kids do not support the changes uh, when it comes to cell phones and, um, and uh, acceptable use, which I think was highly predictable. Um, of the 3,000 responses that were received, which is obviously representative of who responded. On the question of, uh, I will say that, you know, including the prohibition in, in restrooms and locker rooms is, is great. I've heard from several educators who no longer allow students to take their phones with them to the restroom, and suddenly trips to the restroom have plummeted. So um, that's a, a good move. Um, on the question of one party consent, whether it aligns with the law, there's a lot in here that we put in place that does not align necessarily with what the law is outside of our school buildings. Um, so, and I don't think the law defines a one party consent as a right so much as it's not illegal um, as it is in other places. Um, on the question of RB9H, um, malicious misgendering and dead naming, uh, can you confirm for me that this is not a change to the SRNR and that this was put in there last year? That is correct. And that there's no change to that section of the SRNR from last year? From malicious, misgendering and malicious dead naming, that is also right. correct. On, on the question of definitions, I think it is important that we, that we keep in there in some way um, that this, these two things can happen accidentally or maliciously. I think where we, where we mess things up and might get a little confusing is by using the word deliberately instead of mis maliciously. Um, for both definitions, I would suggest removing the qualifiers from the sentence and adding the following to the end of the sentence, which is, this can be accidental or malicious. Um, and that would provide some clarity. Although I'm not certain that we need the clarity because I think it's pretty clear as it is. Um, and, you know, I would also note, and those are definitions on page 66 and 69, by the way, that um, community engagement has been, uh, this, this portion of the SRNR has been through the community engagement process twice now. Um, and uh, other areas that I appreciate the changes being made, um, we've uh, refined and broadened out the concept of outing to include other um, situations such as immigration status and uh, disability and other things, and I think that that is uh, progress and a step in the right direction. Uh, and that is in addition to what we included in last year's SRNR, so very much appreciated. Um, generally speaking, I think the SRNR process, though it's been a little delayed uh, this year, has gone uh, in more depth and um, is resulting in a better end product because of um, the work that's been done. I would say the one point that I would point out from the community engagement process is that there's no real uniform uh, way that people want to digest the information. But what is clear is that older people want it in writing and younger people want it in video. Um, and so I think we need to digest how we're going to accomplish making this accessible in the best way possible for the right people or for the different groups of people. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Frisch. Did you need to go back? Okay. Uh, Ms. Omesh? 
Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Boyd and staff, for some of the changes. Um, I know the definition of ableism um, and faith-based discrimination and, and other components uh, were reflected, and you were responsive, so I do appreciate that. Um, I did, you, you know I have questions, um, so here we go, uh, and I probably will need to go back. But um, I did want to just take a look um, at uh, page, um, so page 10, when we talk about uh, the right to access facilities that are non-stigmatizing for students, um, I know we had a conversation, I guess regulation 2603 is more expansive uh, and accommodates more, uh, you know, diverse needs of students, whether that be faith, whether that be disability. Um, so I'm, I'm curious why those are inconsistent. I think, um, and I know this can be perceived as, you know, anti, I'm just going to name it before, you know, everybody starts feeling a certain way. This can be perceived as anti-LGBTQ, fine for not naming this specifically, but I think what I'm trying to do here is make sure that we're thinking, again, kind of like the equity policy conversation we had in the morning, what are we missing, what are we not thinking about, um, and what has, it, just because it, perhaps it hasn't come to the table or we haven't heard voices re reflecting it, but may still be a need in our uh, student body. So can you help me better understand why we've left those out? Thank you, Ms. Shomess. And so, um, as you shared, we um, did use specific language on last year um, relative to align with Regulation 2603 that was new. And the language in, um, just for, uh, for everyone's general knowledge, um, part of the language in 2603 states, any student who has a need or desire for, for increased privacy, regardless of the underlying reason, shall be provided with reasonable, non-stigmatizing accommodations. And so that's the more broad language in 2603. Um, we specifically called out um, some specific items that are listed in uh, the SRNR because 2603 um, is new. If there is a desire to use the, the broader language, we could certainly do that. Um, but to your point, our, um, our, our thought in not doing that in the updated draft was that we did not want there to be a perception that we were now pulling back on something that we front-loaded on last year. And so um, kind of weighing one side with the other and depending upon perspective, um, that may just be interpreted differently. But the, the protections for, for, for needing that additional privacy for any myriad of reasons is outlined in 2603. Um, and so if, if it's the board's desire for us to have that more broad language in the SRNR, um, we could certainly entertain that. Um, and we welcome uh, the group's thoughts and feedback. Yeah, I mean, because I guess my inclination would be to include additional groups that we know this is a concern for, but then it's like, okay, who are we then missing? You know, I certainly know for disability and faith community there are issues. I can think of that myself because of my lived experiences, but then who and what else are we missing? Um, so I would lean towards doing, rethinking that just a little bit. Um, you know, being consistent with the regulation seems to be a reasonable path forward uh, and being sure that we're clear. I mean, and, and I know certainly in the guidance, it's delineated for every community either way, right? So that it's specific as to what we're talking about. But please. Uh, Abrar, just so I, because I know she lives it every, she's been living it every day for the last three months. You're on page 10, section A, and you're looking at, at number two, the right to access restroom and locker room facilities and other non-stigmatizing accommodations that are consistent with the student's gender identity. And you're proposing different language. Uh, you prefer different language, and help me there. Yeah, language that's more, more inclusive. So um, we can either say gender identity, sexual orientation, faith identity, and disability, or we can try to anticipate what we may not even be considering and match it up with what actually currently exists in Regulation 2603, which says uh, increased privacy regardless of the underlying reason, uh, so long as it is reasonable and non-stigmatizing accommodation. Thank you. That's helpful feedback for me. I got it. And, and, and Dr. Boyd's point is that language is in another regulation. So there is a, a question here. Do you just reference that other regulation or copy the same language in the regulation right here in the SRNR? I guess that's what we have to think about. Yes, and again, we're fine either way. Um, our consideration, we, we just didn't want there to be a misperception. Exactly. No, I'm concerned we about that. that. So that was, that was the push-pull there. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I certainly want to be extremely clear that I imagine, again, in the guidance, we're delineating very specifically what that looks like for every group, um, that, you know, any a trans kid doesn't have to feel stigmatized for picking, um, but also that a kid with a disability or someone of a faith identity minority or anything else, again, that I'm not thinking of right now, um, will be accommodated without feeling stigmatized, absolutely. Um, so that's, that's one. Um, in a similar vein, uh, when I was looking at the right to disclosure, uh, certainly, you know, um, when it comes to things like outing and dead naming, it's very clear gender identity, sexual orientation are key components. I think uh, a number of, you know, members of the LGBTQ community have elevated that to raise our awareness about the importance of that sensitivity. Uh, and I think in, in following along that leadership, we can think of other ways that students feel stigmatized as well for the disclosure of a variety of things. I know we included a specific thing on information exchange when it comes to immigration status, um, but it did get me thinking about, you know, whether that be FRM status, disability, or other sensitive information that students might not feel comfortable with disclosure of. Um, so I, I, you know, I don't know if there's room to be a little bit more expansive there as well. And because outing immigration status is also different than, you know, staff sharing of information. I think that's also an important sensitivity for us to have, that, that kids, you know, feel safe that that's not allowed within the student body and beyond just um, so staff exchange. So, Abroad, and, and Michelle, I'm just doing a little tag team in one, on Section A. Now you're on 7, and you're saying 7 is too limited because we're only talking about personal identifiable information and citizenship and immigration status. You want right, to add? Right, so looking at 7 and uh, two, or 3. Mm -hmm. So non-disclosure, right? Outing, essentially. Okay. Oh, it's nine online. I guess when it printed out, it's page 10. Mm -hmm. 10 on the red line. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because there are other places where we call um, outing of immigration status in this document, right? So okay. outing is a little more expansive than just uh, gender identity and, and orientation. And again, I, I just I want to be like way, way, way clear that this is not to take away from the seriousness and the importance of, uh, you know, the harms caused for, for those who there's are non-binary. There's just some there's some additional language, and maybe Dr. Boyd, you can help. Uh, is there additional language or another number that we could add in here potentially? I guess. And and so again. Um, um, to Michelle Mesh's point, I, I, I certainly understand the spirit and the intent there. Um, all of the um, items listed here in this section are all things that are connected with um, laws, FCPS policies, and or FCPS regulation. And so as we talk about, you know, staff sharing student information, we know that's a violation of FERPA. There's just a, a, a number of things where we talk about confidentiality. And so again, the challenge is when does the list, when does the Right. List in. So it's, you know, we want to be collaborative. So some things were added because, again, um, some of the examples that are listed here were added last year or added this year to reinforce that new regulation 2603 um, that we found. Um, but one of the things I just, to Mr. Frisch's point, we just thought, we, we know that folks, you know, some folks said they're going to read this, the SRNR document. Some people want to watch a video how we make it so that this thing becomes digestible and actually becomes something that people really familiarize themselves with to make it come to life because already we're at like 80 pages. Um, and I know, and my eyes know. Um, and so we wanna make sure, and, and so as we have the push-pull of, we don't want people to believe that this, as we start listing things, if it's not on the list, it's not a thing because they're illustrative, not exhaustive, but then how do we list everything for everything and we'll, so that's just something I just want us to just to consider. And certainly, you know, the board's desire, we're happy to support, but that's just something to keep in the front of your minds. Yeah, I think maybe we can match some of the language, because I do agree that being explicit about the reason why this came to be and the, and the exact things is important too. So maybe if we said something like the right to non-disclosure of sensitive, inf protected sensitive information to include gender identity, sexual orientation, and perhaps other commitments, depending on, you know, legal might have opinions about what, we're com what we can commit to, but FRM status, disability could be additional ones. Ms. Amish, yeah. I think that uh, other board members are probably going to want to comment on that, but there's also, we could also consider definitions, but I think you've opened up a, a good topic for us to discuss past your time. Uh, yeah, yeah, I wanna so go I'll back. I'll put you down for- <laughs> Thank you. I'll put you down for a go back, but I do think, you know, board members, if you're concerned about this, please speak to this. I think one thing we can consider is the definitions. Okay. Um, 
All right, so we had uh, that, that yeah. next we have Ms. Uh, Sizemore Heisen. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to bring up the same thing. I'm going to follow up with what Ms. Cohen was talking about in terms of um, the questioning of students, you know, through just parental notice. I hear what you're saying. Well, it may be more than one student. I don't quite understand how that's a barrier to addressing the concern. So, for example, we could say translation service will be provided to EL students who need it. For example, we could put a carve out for exigent circumstances, which would then allow principals on notice to be able to uh, question around, you know, if there's a safety concern in the school, Dr. Brayman, if there's a safety concern in the school, if there's a safety issue, if there's something that the principal needs to question immediately, they can. But I also am significantly concerned, especially what I brought up with you around um, training for administrators on understanding the manifestations of disability um, and the way certain students with disabilities are pleasers, the way they may script, they may they repeat, that it, without parental consent or without some support there, perhaps you could put something in with support from a case manager or a special education department chair or something, because the goal here is to get accurate information, right? And my concern is if we're giving parent notification and we're questioning somebody who may not have the, the cognitive language or for a disability-related communication ability to give accurate information or accurately understand the questions, it can lead to both discipline that isn't appropriate and inaccurate information. It's not helping anybody. So I guess my question is can we put something in here that carves out, uh, except for under exigent circumstances, which by the way mirrors the MOU, that we will get parental consent to question a student who has an intellectual or developmental disability, which covers autism, by the way, which you brought up earlier, um, or translation service to be provided to students who need them. That would cover that. Or even if we say a case manager or special education teacher will be present to help facilitate the communication. I don't understand why that's not in here because I think it leads to problems. I'll pause there. So if I was understanding Ms. Cohen's um, request, her request, and, and certainly I know she's here, she can correct me, was to have parental consent as opposed to notice. Um, and I, I think what I'm hearing from you is support during the investigation process, which I see as two different things. Mm -hmm. And so on the piece requesting consent, it's, again, using Sloan, he's always my example, little Sloan's parent has to say, if Sloan falls into one of these categories, yes, you can question Sloan. If, I, if his parent says no, we can't question Sloan. Sloan may be pertinent to the investigation process, mm -hmm. but if we put that out there, little Sloan can't provide information that might be valuable, even when it's not right. something that, you know, because one person's perception of safety could be something different. If I punch Shannon, Somebody may say, well, it's not now an existing, you punch Shannon, that's over. Now we're trying to figure out, or they said you punched Shannon. Did you really punch Shannon? Did you not? Was it Vijay? All of those things. And maybe Sloan was the only person there. Or, you know, and again, overly simplified example, but those type of things. So when we talk about consent, that's what I believe was the question that was posed. If we're talking about, and we have some language here, you know, around um, involving the special education case manager, checking with the IEP, making sure students have access to their accommodations. So for students who might have communication devices or um, need translation services, all of those things, students are supposed to have already access to their accommodations during that process. And so um, I'm not sure if I misunderstand the two, but I saw those as two different things. I was responding to the former as opposed to the latter. So I, maybe a clarification, is it permission or if is, is it notification? Mm -hmm. Right, she wants Yeah, Ms. Sizemore Heiser is talking about supports. Notification. I, I think what Dr. Boyd just said is this, one's that can, one is notice and con consent, and we still believe administratively, the administration believes that we need to stick with notice that consent has too many other cases that could go. What I heard you just say is, even if it's about notice, who's in the room to help support that kid as someone is questioning so information isn't taken out of context or someone who would understand perhaps some of the um, communication, difficulties. communication difficulties. And at least could there be reasonable efforts to have some support? 
And Michelle, I think you just said we already have language that speaks to that or we could add language that speaks to that. There's language in there. I'm trying to do a control find to find it quickly now for us as we're talking. I also think there's maybe space to all to well, I'll let you find that and we can. Did you want to continue, Ms. Sizemore Heiser? Yeah, I'll um while you're looking for that, I'll add another thing. I would say that in terms of cell phones, I will just to let my colleagues know I do have two follow-on motions that I'll be sending out drafts of that Laura Jane and I are bringing around cell phones and special education students. I've worked with Dr. Boyd on them. She's approved the language. Um, and it's just really going to be around making sure that our principals are intentional about reaching out to our families as well as the case managers to review IEPs because these IEPs were not drafted with this new cell phone policy in place and so they would not necessarily reflect any needed accommodations and or discussion of accommodations that can be provided without cell phones. So I'll be sending those out. I'll um, send, talk to you about them. But I, I will say that I've talked to secondary school principals and a school like a Lake Braddock, where the middle school's in the middle of the school and the high schools walk back and forth, there's just no way they're going to be able to tell the difference in the hallway between the two. So I do have issues around consistency of implementation, and I'll need to go back. Uh, did you? Are you ready? Okay, go ahead. I found on my Word version, it's on page 58, so give or take. So it's in... Uh, let me see if I is that a red line version, Dr. Boyd? <clears throat> yes, it is... Yeah, I'm about to go. D, as in dog. Oh, I should have went up to the number. Uh, it's D five five, and I'll go. I'll go back up to find the number. But it says if um, it's in the section that starts with consultation with the student's IEP team. It's the second paragraph in that section, and it reads: If any if any written statement concerning a disciplinary incident is requested of a student with a disability, school staff shall consult with the student's case manager or another key member of the IEP team if the case manager is not available, review the IEP or 504 plan and ensure all necessary accommodations are provided to the student. And it reads further on. Yeah, and I guess I was looking to questioning as opposed to written statements. And that's where my, the difference I had. I have seen this, but that was, to me, that's the next step up. And I know I'm out of time, but I just, it's not quite the same. I appreciate the effort. So you'd be saying written or verbal statement is what your advocacy would be or questioning. Okay. Okay, uh, I have you down for, for a go back. Okay, uh, Ms. Tolan. Uh, thank you, I, I wanted to um, voice my support for the cell phone. <laughs> um, uh, what do I wanna what what I call them? Regulations, Language. ideas um, in the SRNR. Um, and, uh, you know, I just want to tell my colleagues, a number of you I had the opportunity to speak with, um, Herndon High School, you know, came out at the, toward the end of the third quarter, um, uh, sort of ahead of the game, and it is using these cell phone uh, regulations. To, and I had the opportunity to be at a meeting there several weeks ago, and everyone was very, very happy with um, the outcome. The APs were seeing less discipline issues around cell phone use um, because they had a school-wide uh, policy that was in effect. Um, the students said, well, we didn't really want it in the beginning, but we're happy now because we are seeing much more robust discussions in all of our classrooms, and you know, we see the benefit of it. The teachers, every teacher that I talked to was thrilled with what they were seeing happening in their classroom compared to um, prior to having this policy in place. So, um, you know, definitely I um, support this. I have had many conversations with Ms. Seismer Heiser on her um, concerns um, for our special ed students, and so we'll happily support those follow on motions, um, you know, just to make sure that those um, students are taken into consideration. Um, one of the things I just uh, had heard, I think, through discussions, so Mr. Rao, I wanted to ask you, um, there was some discussion of was there a way for us to not even allow data to be used in our locker rooms, you know, in particular areas of the school. Is that something we're looking into? If I understand your correct, uh, question correctly, I think you're basically talking about uh, making having some dead zones uh, we uh, so there is 
The short answer is that's not something we considered. It's certainly something we can look into. Um, you know, the question is really, uh, w w there are a couple of, I, I would assume Office of Safety and Security would have some uh, um, input there. Uh, there are some potential problems with just like not allowing anybody to access because there may be times when not, not a student Emergency but other people or... might need to access it. Uh, also blocking, is, it's, is, is it just blocking Wi-Fi or are we even blocking cell phone signal? So uh, it is certainly something we can work on, but I think that it's not just my opinion. There are uh, like physical safety folks who might have some input there, but we'll look into it. Got it. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Um, and that's that's it for me. I'm good. Thank you, Ms. Tolan. Would you you want me to keep you on the list for, as a go back? Are you good? Okay. Uh, Ms. Pekarski. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for working on all of this. Um, I remain a bit of a skeptic, only because I think when you're dealing with kids, when you drastically take away things instead of giving them the tools and the scaffolds to be successful. Um, ultimately, it will, maybe not now, maybe not tomorrow. I just don't think ultimately this is going to work. Um, I hope I'm wrong because I do think cell phones are an issue, obviously, and I do think kids, all of us, are more focused without them. I just worry, um, you know, how much time are our teachers going to spend actually policing these, or are they going to give up? So are we going to be here in a year, two years, saying, okay, let's get rid of them like some other districts have done. Um, maybe it's a short-term thing post-COVID, you know, I, time will tell, I guess. However, um, having said that, when we're now going, you know, to the, to the smart watches, it, like, you know, I, you can't tell if yeah. I'm sitting here looking at the thing or if I'm texting my kid, you know, I'll pick you up in an hour. So I... I put that out there again in that I don't know that this is realistic. So what feedback have you had on that? So um, thank you, Ms. Pekarski. And we know you're not texting on that, on that smartwatch. You're fully engaged. Um, no, all jokes aside. Um, so we wrote that um, for clarity purposes. And I'll, I'll share a, a similar um, response that I shared with someone else. Um, and again, overly simplified, broad, so uh, just, just for the example purposes. There's a number of things that we prohibit in school per the SRNR that we don't check, right? You're not supposed to have cigarettes in school, but we're not searching purses, backpacks, not looking for cigarettes. Um, a, a num the list, cigarettes, <laughs> we're going to have to check Dr. Anderson. I don't know. It's her birthday, so we'll give her a bye. Uh, but just a number of things. And so I say that to say that these things aren't an issue until it becomes an issue. I'm in, um, you know, algebra two class, pre-calc, whatever it might be. And I'm actively, and you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I may be this blunt where I'm texting on my watch or my music is going off, or that's when it becomes an issue. And even then, hey, little Sloan, you know you're not supposed to have cut, disable that because Sloan is the one, always. Um, we redirect and we go back on to teaching two-step equations or solving, you know, the Pythagorean theorem, whatever it is that's happening, but we're not doing smartwatch checks in schools. That, we want to be very clear about that. We're not doing smartwatch checks. But I think that's where we get into this, well, how's this going to actually play out? Because you think I'm using, no, I'm not. I was just checking the time and looking at my, you know, I don't know, nice picture on there while we all sit and wait. So um, I don't know what that looks like. I don't know how I just, I cannot see this. I just cannot see this. i um, struggling a lot with it. Also, to the comments that were made about the secondary schools um, and middle schools as well, I'm still trying to understand the rationale between the different approach between those two, um, you know, different levels. So if I could get a little bit more from that. <laughs> <laughs> it probably won't be anything different than you've heard before, so I'll start with that. <laughs> well, it, but if yeah. it truly does, I mean, many of us have kids of our own. The difference by and large of a middle school kid and your high school kid, maturity-wise, responsibility-wise, we're giving you additional benefits. You can, start, you know, just those things, just the response, even if you look at our discipline, middle school is our most challenging place. So that and we get question. the reasons why, right? Okay. I mean, you're going through, we won't do family life, but there's all of those different things that impact what's happening to middle school kids. 
And so they need that level of support. And so again, we did a lot of engagement around that. Um, but that's, that's the overarching theme for why there's a delineation between middle school and high school, generally speaking. Stella, let me take the other thing though, because you are, it's a fundamentally deep reflective thought. I've thought about it too, like what are we doing here, right? Where is this gonna go? I don't know where it's gonna go. I just know I'm trying to listen to those teachers that are in there all year this year. Almost everybody was back and our principals, they're begging for it. And we all, you know, Tammy was here last time. We've all pre-pandemic had some level of addiction to technology and phones and it got worse. It did get worse for everybody. And our folks are asking for a, I mean, that's what they, they're asking for a zigzag and where it goes, I'm not sure, but I do believe they need this, want this. And what Elaine said, honestly, because it was a bit of a stir, one of our principals went ahead and said, look, I don't see anything prohibiting me from doing this, I'm gonna do it. So we had almost like a three month mini experiment and the worst fears weren't realized. That's what I would say to the board even today as you look at passing this on Thursday, you know it's ultimately your decision. Actually, the kids after a little bit understood we're trying to get back to that pre-pandemic learning environment, and that's part of what this is. But I, I'm not saying it's a, it's a silver bullet, and I'm not saying you all may not have to revisit it uh, in a few years, um, and then I'll be working with you at a state level trying to figure <laughs> out what to do. But, yeah. I, but, I, but I honestly think doing this will actually, I think it will be one more thing to help our teachers um, in the second year coming out of this pandemic in person. That's my, that's my thought and I'm, I feel good about that going, uh, getting up every day and thinking about next year. Yeah, I hope you're right. I think the real root of the issues is not cell phones, but if that helps us get to those, um, okay, fine, time will tell. Um, but I think we name that and at least acknowledge that we will probably be uh, re-looking at this, I think. Totally one of you are off for just a, oh, before I get off this, communication around this to our kids, to our parents, very, very important. We've got to prepare them for this. Um, it is going to be a big um, shift for many. I didn't see any, and I, it could be me, anything about earbuds? Did I miss that? No, we just called out smart watches, and I think we put in accessories or devices. Let me do a control find. So, so that it's, was it's the, under, the big bucket. Okay, mm -hmm. okay. I, I missed that. Okay, thank you. The other one, I will just, since I have a, a little bit of a few seconds, I know I brought this up to you, Dr. Boyd. I brought it up with a few people, and then nobody has really, you know, uh, taken on to this. Our dress code. We are not defining the terms of private areas, excessive amount of bare skin. Principles are whole inconsistent about what that means, how they are addressing it. It's a very big problem. I hear it consistently, consistently, and have since we put this out. Um, I'll take a little bit of a go, unless you want to speak to it now. So the only thing that I'll say now, um, because as you, you notice, we haven't made any proposed changes relative to the dress code, but to your point, we have heard feedback. It was even a question about sports bras at one of the, the community forums, and we responded to that, that, that that's clearly an undergarment, which is prohibited <laughs> from being worn, Sorry. you know, without something over it. Um, but we do know that teachers have expressed that that has gone from zero to 100. Um, and so, um, we didn't, and in full transparency, we didn't take it up during this round after we received the feedback because there were already so many big buckets that we were lifting up, if you will. Um, and so that's, that's truly the honest answer. And I think that as we um, peel back the layers of the onion around dress code, if we want to have added specificity outside of adding a definition, that that would truly um, warrant some additional community engagement, which would take, mm -hmm. you know, much more time. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you okay, so good. much. Uh, should I put you down for a go back? Uh, Maybe. Okay. All right. Uh, we have next Ms. McLaughlin. Wow. I'm going to have to race the clock on this one. All right. First thing, cell phone usage. I am a thousand percent with Ms. Pekarski on this one. I talked to all four of my high school leadership classes in the Braddock District 
and the, the high school students in particular were saying, you know, what is the... Um, so, you know, I, 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 we talked about you want to help kids with skill building. This goes back probably at least seven years to when my youngest was in high school. The teacher was phenomenal. She said, come into my classroom, take your cell phone, put it on the right top corner of your desk, face down. In a 90-minute class, she then said, okay, 45-minute brain break. Flip your phone over, see if your mom and dad or a parent, guardian are trying to reach you. Do you have any issues about after school you got to attend to? Or maybe you're just going to check your phone for any text messages that are meaningful. Turn it back down, get back to learning. I mean, uh, truth be told, I ask every adult in this room, you tell me when you've put your phone away for the day. Entirely away the day. Why do parents give phones to their kids? Not just because they want them to play on it, because it's a way to communicate and reach your kid. So... I just feel like, you know, Scott, your heart's in the right place and you want to help our teachers, but I'm a little disappointed that our solution was, I, I think, just too extreme. It's not based in 21st century. Um, you know, if kids aren't going to look at their cell phone, let, they're going to just doodle. I mean, you can't control when a kid's going to pay attention or not. So that was the other thing the kids said is, what do, you, what do you think happened before you were in cell phone? Kids passed notes to each other. Things were going to happen. Um, I would rather we build and help kids to, you know, the, the scaffolding and, and, and healthier habits. That's part of educating the whole child. So I think we've got some work to do on the cell phone thing. Um, that one gives me pause. Parent consent, um, you know, as I've got one minute left, um, Michelle, could you be a little more clear because I've fought for this for 10 years as many other board members have. Parents do not want their kids being interviewed or any other, yeah, I'm not using the bad word. They don't want them being interviewed, especially when they're minors because depending on the age and maturity level of the kid. So when did we move off of, because parent notification is very different from parent consent to interview kids. So the, the language that is in the current SRNR, I can, I'll have to go back and do prior history um, reviews prior to my coming, but that language has not changed since I've been here. Now, granted, that's only two years. So the language that's currently existing is at least uh, two years old. It, the, the difference may be the SRNR language, um, and John, rem <coughs> remind me, you know, because Sandy Evans, I remember we were working on this too, and the hearing office uh, language. Um, yeah, we'll have to go back because I know there was a there was a change that we did with the hearing office language, and that may be different from the SRNR language. And I'll have to go back and research that. I know what you're talking about. I'll three just or tell four my colleagues. Ago. I think this is going to be a, a a real challenge and concern for me to go backwards. Exigent circumstances, absolutely. If there is an emergency, and you know, I appreciate Dr. Boyd saying, well. Who defines emergency? Common sense defines emergency. If you're talking about life, death, you know, drugs are being ingested by somebody, um, you know, and then dress code, I can't emphasize enough what Ms. Prokarski said. Scott, has the HSPA spoken to you? Because I'm hearing from my principals that the language with things like clothing should be fit, neat, and clean, conform to good taste and decency, that is so broad. Like, I'm, I'm just at the, oh my gosh, this is not working. And our, our families, are our principals are telling board members this. I think we changed that, I almost want to say 10, 15 years ago, Francis. Do you remember that when we were, when we were ass? It might have been Ryan. No, Ryan we, we took out because, yeah, we felt that there was gender discrimination in the language. That's actually what it was, and it was in, in the last five years. Okay, so, just, just so. for history here, Ryan McLevine had us take out the examples of what was considered unacceptable language, uh, unacceptable clothing. The neat, clean fit conforms to good taste and decency. That was not any board that I've sat on. That's... That's older language, and I think be. that needs to be tackled. That's I think I think Michelle is right. This may 
this may be a topic that you all say, and either now or it's a follow-on that we need to look at and engage. Dress code is a huge issue that either can bring us together, it can be exclusive or inclusive. We've got to get it right. Um, I will I will say this, and Michelle, just with two weeks for myself to go, the one place I went, the work was done less on the writing and more on creating visuals, and I think they did a space alien, to be honest. Um, Lovely. And it was the space, I, I, I know, and I know, I know, I'm not trying to, but it was like E.T. with the right dress code, so, it. and it took all of the whatever out of it and said this was appropriate, this wasn't, and um, I'll tell you a little bit more about it, but actually kids reacted to that a lot better right. than five paragraphs, so did parents. Well, I'll, I'll need to go back on this one because that's I helpful. I, I have you. All right, I'm going to take my turn on uh, just a couple of things. Ooh, With two minutes. <laughs> Chair's privilege. <laughs> With respect to notice, um, I know we had a lot of conversations in those hearings with respect to getting notice to parents and so I'm I, I, I don't recall that it was actually consent though we we they had to have an they had to reach out to the parent but sometimes you couldn't reach the parent and due to exigent circumstances things would continue I do think we need to talk about that a, a little bit more I understand uh, Ms. Sizemore Heiser with respect to additional supports if a special education child is involved but you know when I do talk to some of the principals their concern is, hey, how do we wrap this up and minimize a problem? So I think that's what you're balancing. I don't know if you want to bring us something back on that. Um, with respect to how we communicate, I like, I like the various ways. I am curious as to how we're going to make sure uh, folks are getting educated properly because I, I do think sometimes even our staff members are trying to figure it out in real time. So hopefully uh, we're working on that as well. Um, on page uh, 16, we talk about unexcused absences, and we define it as missing the whole day. I'm wondering uh, how we're dealing with people who may, you know, just decide to skip calculus every day. That certainly has an impact, um, but it's not addressed here. So stop my time, please, and um, if you could address that. So I was searching for your section on my my it's my, page my document. Oh, um, okay, sorry. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, and I don't. Are you referring to the S bar chart? It's page or a narrative. I, I think it's narrative. Page sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Page sixteen. It defines chronic absences, um, but it doesn't talk talking about five or more. But it talks about it being an entire day. Mm -hmm. Some of some kids are creative and they go to school sometimes to certain parts of the day. That's still harming them. Are we dealing with that in here? Sure. And so in this section, this talks about um, for the, the five or more unexcused days, that's just certain things per our attendance codes that that five day section triggers. Um, but certainly in our S bar chart, we talk about unexcused tardies to class and then um, just overall unexcused absence. And we, we do specify that you can't have exclusionary practices there. But we do, while everything is not written out here in the, um, in the SR and all, we have an actual whole attendance regulation with communicating and reaching out to the family if kids are missing classes or missing school and following up. So there's a lot of, we piecemeal reference certain things. So we just pull out snippets. And so it, it doesn't look really comprehensive here because we're pulling from something else okay. to reference here. Okay. Okay. Um, next is on page 18, definition of digital citizenship. Uh, I think we do a really good job when we talk about distribution of literature, the very next paragraph in, but digital citizenship um, and uh, what that entails is much less inclusive. And I really want people to understand when you're harming another person with a photo or et cetera, that that's covered. So I would like to consider whether in can help us in that definition you have up there in the way that you're talking about digital citizenship. And I wonder, um, and Vijay may be able to help us, the, the information pulled in digital citizenship and um, some of the other pieces are pulled as language that's lifted up from 6410, the acceptable use 
policy regulations. So again, we're, we're piecemealing some things because we know that um, the cybersecurity, the digital citizenship was something that the board lifted up as something that wanted to be reflected here. But more comprehensive information is in that draft reg um, in 6410. Um, and, and certainly, again, we were just trying to think of volume, extent, not replicating another full regulation in this regulation. And so there's pros and cons to that, as we just saw with the attendance reference. Right. My concern is with um, the digital stuff. It seems like we're defining that now, right? People are starting to learn that. Mm -hmm. And the other paragraph is just so much more helpful than the general language that we're using above it. So just for your consideration, because I do think that's going to require a lot of uh, community support and um, outreach and parents understanding and kids understanding. And if it's more like in, then parents can have that conversation with their kids. So what I hear you saying is you almost like some of the specificity in yeah. in up in that top paragraph about digital citizenship. Yes, yes digital means you don't go on and do these things on Precisely. social media. And it's, and it's okay. clarity for the family and for the student. Got it. Okay. 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 Thank you. Um, I've got 17 seconds. Hold on. While you're looking, if I could just verify, I went over with John Foster. We haven't changed anything in the regulations, none of our regulations from notice to consent. It's always been notice. What we did change with the prior board is if notice wasn't happening, we still brought those packets forward to the hearing office and ultimately to the board. We instituted a new packet check where notice had to be provided. And that was a change made with the previous board. Uh, Ms. McLaughlin, I just wanted to reference that to the history I went back over. And it would not come forward to the board anymore if we were not giving parents that appropriate notice. And it became a part of the hearings office checklist. So that was the reform we made. It's still been a uh, uh, notice, just FYI. Thanks. Okay, I'll say quickly that with respect to the cell phone stuff, I'm willing to try. Uh, I put the wrong page down, but there's a paragraph that says students suspected of alcohol use. Uh, it doesn't mention other drugs. And I'm just wondering if we want to say suspected of substance abuse so you don't have to have that discussion. Do you know what page that was? Just I see her looking at me was, too. I thought it was 20, but I wrote the wrong number down. So I'll, I'll keep, I'll look, I'll look while I call on the next person who has a go back. Um, that brings us back to Dr. Anderson. All right, thank you. I want to dig a little bit into this survey. Um, I noticed here that on the very front page it says that there are 22 community members and nine other who completed this. Can you give a little bit more information in terms of who are these community members? I thought the survey was geared at staff parents and guardians and students. Yes, it was disseminated to FCPS staff and also um, families. And so um, unless somebody else shared the link or just how people identified, I'm assuming that um, perhaps someone may be identifying in just one category or another, but it wasn't a posted, it wasn't a publicly posted link. And so okay. unless somebody shared it outside, because I continue this survey to have went this to those concern persons. with our surveys that when they're posted and sent at large, we're getting feedback from people who are not the stakeholders that we, we, we really need to hear from. That has always concerned me. So this also raises that flag. Um, secondly, I, I see you've got lots of questions here. I think most of them were Likert scale questions. There was one that um, was open-ended. Can you give us a summary of some of the feedback you received from the open-ended um, question? Can I follow up with you? Deb has all of that information committed to memory and she wasn't able to join us today and so I don't want to give misinformation um, around that item. I will put you down for follow-up. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am. And also I, I, I said this last time and I'm glad that Ms. Cohen raised it. I do want to lend my support for changing the language from, parent, from just parents, the parents and guardians. Um, so I want to share that. The piece regarding parental consent. I'm getting a little bit confused here. Are we talking about, or the piece that you were talking about, Ms. McLaughlin, was that for all students to have consent before they can be interviewed by an administrator? You know, as a former principal, this raises all kinds of hairs for me because it will just literally make it so much more difficult for schools to 
engage in investigating any issue and wrapping up any issue. So we also stand the risk of having kids that, are, that have been hurt and then the schools can't do anything about it because the parent did not give consent. And I, I, I thought the code also provided opportunity for, um, for the schools to be able to have that um, latitude to investigate without parental consent. I don't know if you wanna just talk to that a little bit, John, whenever you get the time, because I know I've been placed in that position where a parent says, you can't talk to my child unless I give consent. Well, we do have um, the, the right to do that. I'm just really concerned about having the pendulum swinging so far in the other way that we are not going to be able to resolve any situations with kids, even the simplest things. You know, we're talking about all of these things here require conversations with kids to follow up. All of this will be so extremely stunted. I'm very concerned. Having said that, what I do want to share is I, I, I appreciate what you talked about regarding Ms. Um, Sizemore Heiser's, com Sizemore Heiser's comments, which is to provide the support with the language, with the case manager. And I noticed in the page that you referred, it says written. I would love for there to be an opportunity for oral as well, because you always start with the oral statements. Yeah. And if you have a child that doesn't speak the language or can't understand the question that's being asked, they're going to need that support at that stage as well. So I would love to yeah, see. Yeah, and, and I think we heard uh -huh. some others, and it's you've heard it now, and Dr. Board and I, I think we can add that one word. We're all, <laughs> frankly, when administrators are in there writing written statements, they're, it's oral, written, we might as well just put it together and say, provide the support anytime you're gonna bring that kid in for questioning. So we can make that change, and it's something both of you um, have raised. And this is this is why, actually, and I wanna, Thanks, Chair Pekarski and Vice Chair Sizemore Heiser for doing this extra hour here instead of doing it at the board table Thursday. This this was I'm just being honest. I wasn't Didn't sure. The on the, no, this is much better, and I think we just have to, Dr. Boy. We already agreed the longer timeline to do SR and R the way this board has helped bring us to bring the community in. We need a longer timeline, and we need a final look before we do the vote almost like we're doing the budget process where we right. did that work session right before. So this has been helpful and it's gonna make Thursday go a lot, lot more smoothly. Okay. It, is, it is, it is. And my last point is regarding the cell phones. As a parent who did give her sixth grader a cell phone, I don't have an expectation that he's going to be responding to that cell phone during the school day. I've tried very hard to text them when I know it's lunch or after school. And so there would be no expectation on my part that it's an English class and he's responding to me. And I wanna say thank you to um, Ms. Tolan for sharing what has been happening at Herndon because I think that is a site where we could actually have some good lessons learned. I also, I run out of time, so I'm gonna quickly point out to, I think it was in May, Ms. Um, Corbett Sanders sent to us a little quick study that a teacher did regarding whether or not cell phones were allowed in the classroom and the level of student engagement versus when it wasn't. Um, this is not the end all to be all. Um, you know, I, I don't know the level of this um, mathematics, et cetera, but it is very helpful. And we wanna be responsive to Okay, she wanted me to stop, so. <laughs> um, I, I just wanna be sure we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater on this one. We know it's gonna be a shift. We have a lot of things that are shifts for our kids but this is really to help them. And frankly, it's easier to doodle on a sheet of paper than to be watching YouTube shorts. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Ms. Corbett Sanders, you have, I have you down for a go back. Yes, um, and thank you. I did just send you an older version of the SRNR that had some more specific language and I would urge that we kind of mesh what we've been talking about. Um, for our students with disabilities and uh, communications challenges in um, any instance where we are having questions. So thank you for uh, taking a further look at that. On the cell phone piece, I did wanna share, because as many people know, I, I made most of my career was in technology <laughs> cell and cell phones. So um, I, I love cell phones. Um, 
However, um, digital citizenship is really important, and it's a skill that is essential. It does make a difference in classrooms. Um, I would suggest, you know, I talk to my daughters who are both 20-something-year-olds, and they're teleworking, and they talk about how th there's clear guidance in that experience or in that workplace that they are not to be using their personal um, cell phones during business meetings and different, and when they are conducting business, they shouldn't be also sending personal texts and stuff. Um, one daughter in particular, because she does work with the Pentagon, actually when they go in, they, they check their cell phone. And so what we're asking for our kids to do is not any different. It's teaching them the discipline to be responsible. And um, sometimes it is hard to pull back from where we were. But we know that, you know, when I grew up in the 60s and 70s, we didn't have um, seat belts. And all of a sudden, we started wearing seat belts. And oh, look, it, it, it made for a safer environment. You know, we, we do add new disciplines in life. And so I would just urge that um, this is one where our, our, our principals and others really do, um, and teachers would appreciate a little bit more guidance. And so I think this helps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I believe uh, Ms. Uh, Cohen, go back. Or go back. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I, I just wanted to say a few things. One, I agree that um, number five on page 60 um, about the consultation with the student's IEP team only says written. It doesn't say verbal. So I certainly support um, the conversations that that needs to be added. Um, you know, the other I would say, especially in light of the changes that the legislature made about mandatory reporting, um, I am even more fearful of how we have kids who struggle with communication um, and without their parents being involved, we just have to show that we left a voicemail that these kids, what they say in that moment, or maybe not even what they're able to say, like, is their communication partner required to be there? Because our kids who are using ATS, their case manager or a member of their IEP team is likely not the person who helps them communicate with the device. So I, I'm just really concerned that I, I understand this makes it harder for administrators. That's not my goal, but my goal is that things that children are saying to adults who are in charge in ways that they may or may not understand now have an even greater potential to impact them for the rest of their lives. Um, thanks to the General Assembly. So I, I am, I, I know that I continue to press on this, but I, I cannot understand um, that we would say that, that children who struggle with communication, both receiving it um, and being able to transmit it, that we're gonna say it's just sufficient to notify their parents and not guarantee that they have somebody who can make sure that they're able to communicate and understand what's happening I can only liken it to like, if heaven forbid I was in a Turkish prison, like I would pay, I would pray that there was somebody in there who would say, Laura Jane has to have an interpreter. So I just don't, I don't know, Turkish prison was all I could come up with, sorry. But, you know, point taken that I, my big concern is that kids are being held responsible for saying things um, or typing things that they may or may not understand. They have full ramifications of. Thank you, Ms. Cohen. Your time is up. Um, any feedback? No, I think the I think the the piece that uh, once we add the um, um, questioning uh, to the paragraph where it talks about use of accommodations, I think that, that generally that will answer it because if it's if it's an accommodation that will leave Little Sloan alone that Francis <laughs> needs and it's something that she uses, that's listed as an accommodation on her IEP, so she has access to that, or accommodation on her 504. Um, so I, th I think that that would, I think that might subside some anxiety um, with the incorporation, incorporation of that added element. Okay, maybe you, if you can send something out to us before yes, Thursday, that might be helpful. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Omesh? Thank you. Um, happy to follow Ms. Cohen, actually, and would support looking into that piece specifically. Uh, and then the Guardian piece, I would uh, just want to bring that back and say that I support it regardless of how long it makes the document, if, if uh, we can do that. 
Um, I want to make sure my colleagues are aware of a follow-on motion that I do plan to bring. It kind of speaks to what we talked about last work session, just in terms of having more accountability and central review uh, of instance, incidents of prejudice across our system, regardless of what kind of identity is impacted by that, to uh, investigate, monitor, and then develop recommendations around action uh, related to that. I know, thanks to Dr. Ivy's leadership um, and a number of staff we met weeks ago, and I know staff have kind of been formulating their ideas as to how that might be implemented, where that might live, et cetera, but it's really just to codify those conversations and uh, look, look towards future um, conversations around what that might look like and how that might manifest. So I just want to put that on everyone's radar. Everyone is aware. We've had the conversation many times over months, so <laughs> nobody can say they were caught off guard on Thursday. <laughs> All right. Um, the other thing, I did want to just bring up uh, S the SBAR codes component, and this might be more of a question for John. I don't know, but we're, we're categorizing uh, things like malicious outing um, as the same as like removal of religious head gar garb, and I think there's something different about a physical offense versus kind of the more emotional piece, which we're trying to capture more broadly. Number one, I definitely think we need to add slurs and, um, and symbols in there somehow, because that's much broader, uh, other than just kind of outing, right? So it's just an additional piece of what discriminatory harassment is. Uh, and number two, I would venture to think that the room, you know, any student touching a student should be at least category E, as opposed to just category D, which is more um, intangible, right? So I just kind of wanted to understand the rationale. I don't know if that was an oversight, maybe it was a mistake, um, but to separate those out. Perhaps an attempted one is category D, but then, you know, if there was a physical assault, it, it belongs, I think, somewhere what else. What page was that you were referencing? So, yeah, sorry, I'm jumping right in. Um, so we're on page 23 of the online document, so probably 24 or something in yours. Um, S, in the S bar codes for category D, discriminatory harassment. Um, and then I'm curious why we also just segmented out certain ones over others rather than had them all as individual ones or, yeah. Okay. So just, <laughs> yeah, a lot. Just, Good. just to um, answer a, a part of it. So when uh, Ms. Omesh is referring to category D as in dog versus E, category E, um, each of our S bar codes are um, grouped into a certain overall category. Category E is titled behaviors that endanger self or others. Um, these behaviors endanger the health, safety, and or welfare um, of either the student or others in the school community. And so the um, items listed there um, are things such as assault, group assault, assault and battery, fighting, striking of staff, drugs, possession, et cetera. Um, and, and the list goes on, many of which are drugs, fire, gang, hazing, things like that. And so the state delineates which SBAR codes go into which category. Category D right now, D as in dog, um, I'm scrolling up. That is where the discriminatory harassment currently lists, and that's based on where the state has placed that respective SBAR code. And so. That's not a placement that we've done locally. That's a placement that's done by the state and how they categorize discriminatory this. harassment. Those the codes that are associated in which bucket it falls in: D as in dog versus E as an elephant. No, that's the nugget right there. You're saying the state has dictated the categories of the codes, not us. But right. we included the example, right, of including malicious removal of religious garb mm -hmm. so the, under. Yeah, yeah, so the examples we've added on um, as examples, it doesn't change the code. It doesn't pl change the placement of which bucket falls into the code. All of that is by the state. Um, the examples that we added um, were based on stakeholder engagement and feedback to provide what might, what might discriminatory harassment look like. And in some of those categories where we broke things out A through E or A through F, it all rolls up into that same state code, but they're delineating it by the level, the letter. That's really just local for local data purposes for us to say, well, how many times were there issues with racial slurs? We could pull that data out as opposed to seeing the big overarching bucket. Can we change that to attempted removal? And that way, my concern is like if a principal is trying to identify what to do with that, they're going to see that under discriminatory harassment when it also involves a physical assault, right? So maybe if we say attempted, that way it's like, okay, there's this discriminatory piece and then there's also the physical piece of it, which could be addressed with category E. You see what I'm saying? I do. And uh, Time? I know. You've got big timer. 
right. All right. Well, you can give yeah. me another go back then. Okay. But is okay. that a possibility? Okay. Let's, Could someone let's answer let's that? Let her respond. We let's need to her... consult with, yeah, that's what I was going to say. We okay. need to consult offline with counsel because I, I think that's a little bit more nuanced, but let, let us just follow up. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll do that. Ms. Sizemore Heiser? Yeah, briefly, I know um, Dr. Boyd, you and I talked about this a little bit and I mentioned to John Foster as well, but I do have some concerns about our SBAR codes given SB 36. Um, I know of a case, and I've talked to you about this, of a first grader who has several assault and battery and intimidation of staff. So I'd love to find out a little more about what flexibility we have in these SBAR codes, especially when you're looking at young children and children with disabilities um, and when, the, when there is an intent or especially criminal intent behind their behavior. So I just want to put that out there because yeah. given the mandatory reporting, this is, is really problematic the way we're coding some of our um, young students, especially behavior yes. issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah. yeah, so I've, I've, I know I've flagged for you, Dr. Boyd, so I just wanted to bring that up. I'd love to sort of get more information on that and what we can do. And, and just to bring everybody up to speed, and thank you, Ms. Sazmar Heiser. Uh, she and I chatted um, a couple of times about that. Um, we have we will follow up again to get some um, additional detail on reaching out to the state um, but the question on the table is if for example michelle strikes and i'm a student yeah. um whether regardless of age if i strike a staff person you know what is that and we have certain codes that are um delineated by the state and so and i was trying to pull up my email so i can look at it and read it verbatim to you but one is assault and battery and, and i believe um and i'll pull it up in a second that's, that's the appropriate code if there's injury and then they're striking a staff that's another code if, they, if I hit a teacher and I didn't cause injury. Um, and so those are the definitions and delineations in, our, um, in the student behavior and administrative responses um, codes that are provided by the state. And so the question that Ms. Seismer Heiser is asking, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, is <laughs> do we have any additional latitude to name it something else? Um, and so that's something that we're following up on to date. We've not received any feedback that we have latitude to, to name that something else. Um, we do want to say that, and also um, we're also working with council um, relative to HB4, or Senate Bill 36 is the same thing. Um, when it talks about mandatory reporting to law enforcement, uh, that is referring to, and, and you'll see the details in the document, but the piece that's the broadest, um, which we're working with counsel to define, is the quote-unquote wounding, because they're stabbing, um, death, some other things that are very black and white. Um, but the wounding is the one that's a little bit gray that we're um, trying to get some additional detail in terms of definitions from the code and things like that, because that would probably be the one that's the most broadly interpre interpreted versus the other things that are very, very much black and white and explicit. And so we're working with counsel on that. Um, and as we know inf more information, we will certainly bring that forward. Um, and you know that that was recent passing of legislation. So just trying to get clarity around that. Well, and what you referenced there was the old bill. That's not even including what's under the new bill for misdemeanors. So it's even broader than what you have there. Um, I just bring this up because I've heard of young children, first graders, with yeah. since March, four or five assault and batteries for disability-related behavior on there. So I'm very concerned about this. And, and obviously, we want to keep our teachers and staff safe. We want to. We don't want to have students having egregious behaviors. But when we're looking at our young kids and students with disabilities at that age and mandatory reporting to the police and the, the, the discipline disparities we already have, I'm super, super worried. Um, I do want to say with the, when you go back to the, um, I appreciate adding in, you know, written or verbal, but I think instead of just case manager, key IP partner, we need to have communication partner as Ms. Right, or, or trusted communication partner. The other concern I have is when it says needed accommodation, because when you have a child with communication issues, it may not be issues that need a, let's say an ATS device, but just has needs communication support, and that, that may not be written as an accommodation. So I just want to be careful that we're not narrowing that piece of that on page 61. Um, and, and that's a piece, and certainly we can talk a little bit more offline. I, th I think it's more cut and clear when there are, um, and again, I'll use an overly simplified example, so, so I'll say that in advance. Um, but as we talk about accommodations, there are things that the data has indicated that a student needs ac across settings, and it's not just something that we implement at the time. So for example, testing accommodations, and again, overly simplified example, um, we don't give kids unique testing accommodations just on the day of the test. That's accommodation that I've used throughout instruction that I'm also using on the test. And it may present a little bit differently. And so our, our thought now is that um, or just a, a point to chew on again, we can and talk further offline, um, is creating 
determining the need for an accommodation for an isolated event that wasn't determined by the IEP team. So that, that's something that would bring about pause. And so if Michelle needs a communication, a communication assistant, if I need that to access my environment, to access the FAPE, that's something that should be already be articulated in my IEP, not something that's newly added for a specific circumstance. And some students have that. Some kids have one-to-ones or communication, board, all of those different things. But I just think we just have to be careful about considering a new accommodation for a unique circumstance that whereby the IEP didn't deem that as something that was warranted and that would be a one-off as opposed to something that Michelle is using consistently as supported by the data. So what I'm trying to get at is a student who is communicating at several levels below grade level in self-contained classes but may not have an accommodation on the accommodations page around communication because they're still communicating, they're just, their comprehension is at several, that's what I'm talking about. Okay. Right, and I understand we don't need to have an IEP accommodation in case, there, but but a principal could say there's no nothing checked on their accommodation page. But this is a child in self-contained academic classes, whether on SOL track or not, who has significant and it's written maybe all it's in all over their goals. It's all over their they have communication goals and social goals. And um, I know I'm just I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We have somebody that has to leave, and we've got just a few okay, more I just, people. To I'll just, uh, I'll do just that question. So that's what I, I knew. We need to we need to identify those in this situation. And I, this language, I don't think it gets that. That's okay. what I'm trying to get. I, I understand, and thank you for your passion. I, I, I just want to accommodate the few people that are on the list. Ms. Pekarski, did you need a go back? Yeah, I'll be real quick then. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that also, I don't know how we get to the answer to this, but I think it's even kids with anxiety, mm -hmm. um, having a child who will say something and that circumstance that is very different than what will come home. Um, it, anyway, I we need more discussion. I guess we'll take it on offline. I will just quickly say, hopefully somebody is going to bring some type of amendment on the parent uh, portion of this throughout the document. I also think it is very limiting. It's not inclusive. And I, it could be also very, um, you know, uh, to a parent, to somebody who is a caregiver but not a parent, confusing. Like, does this apply to me? I know we have the definition, but this is documented. Yeah, I'm not ridiculous. sure an amendment. Maybe we can make a change in the definition I, and then work I on the wording throughout. I think uh, that would be great if we could just do that. Parent or guardian, just the way we do everything else. I think that would be great. Um, Anyway, I, I will stop, but I think Ms. McLaughlin and I were, are going to do something for the dress code. We just are not sure what, so we'll talk to you. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin just happens to be next. Look at that. So um, this is actually language that um, a, a principal had provided to me through conversations that other principals were having with each other. So in the dress code, we um, define what's prohibitive prohibited clothing can include, but we don't give any definition or explanation of examples of excessive amount of bare skin. So one suggestion was examples of, of excessive amount of bare skin includes, but not limited to, colon, stomachs, ribs, cleavage, bottoms displayed below the shorts. It's short and sweet. I'll send it to all of you. Again, this was some suggested language. But all we're doing is just inserting a definition where we don't have it. As I entertained you all earlier, the neat, clean, good taste standards of what, I mean, that is a whole other ball of wax I think we'll have to attack in the next SR iteration. But this one I think our principals are dying for. And, again, I, I would like to see if we can't consider that. Maybe, Scott, You'll send it around, if I to, send it around to, to the board and to you and Michelle, Michelle and your team, please. you guys may look at it and say, that's an easy one. We can endorse as superintendent. And Yeah, if you send it around t tonight or tomorrow morning, yeah. we can And then take my colleagues all Thursday. say, without objection, you know, he can put it in as the part of these revisions we're doing. Um, and I just wanted to say, because doc unfortunately Dr. Anderson's not here, I would hope for anyone who's worked with me, and the longer you've worked with me, the more you know, I am not an absolutist ever. So I'm not saying, oh, it's parent consent or you can't ever talk to that child, and that there's no variations when you talk about the severity, the seriousness. But I mean, we had so many situations where principals were saying, 
we couldn't, you know, we tried to notify, we just left a voicemail. Then they interviewed a kid on something that happened weeks ago that was not exigent, it was not any reason to not at least have had the conversation to the saying the parent. And the consent piece was more of, most of the time when we notify, parents simply are saying, if you're gonna to talk to my child who's a minor, even the police give the, the courtesy of parents to be with their child when that investigation or it, it, this, that interview is happening because kids are scared. They're scared and, and to not have that respect Thank and understanding. You, um, so I appreciate that. I hope that's helpful to you. I will only add one thing and that is I am very concerned about the new legislation coming out of Richmond. Um, I don't think that the uh, nuances are clear enough. And at a minimum, I, Dr. Braban, I, I wonder if some sort of statement should be made at our next meeting so that the community is aware that we have been given a directive from the state level that we think can create some uh, discipline implementation problems. I mean, I think it, in, it says, you know, if a child has, has drank alcohol, it has to be reported to the police. I mean, yeah. really? Yeah. I mean, not that I advocate that at all. <laughs> Let me make that very clear. Um, but that's typically not what the police are going to handle. And parents will get upset with us for doing something that we would consider unreasonable. So Dr. Braybrand, I would simply just ask that a statement of what this means, what those changes have been. Maybe uh, Mr. Malloy can make some recommendations or our counsel as to what we can do. We can look but at, at a minimum, we need to notify our parents that this is the charge we have been given we don't agree with it, but right. we have to notify the community. Right. The state took away principal discretion in this general assembly session, and we do need to let our community know. So At a I'll work on At some a communication on that uh, from Thursday. And this feedback was helpful. I, look, I'll just say today, first, I'm so glad we did this as opposed to Thursday. <laughs> there still may be, you know, I, I feel like the SRNR is maybe ultimately the Mona Lisa, you know, Da Vinci kept it. He never actually gave it to the owner. He was supposed to. He kept it his whole life and said it was imperfect. So I think Dr. Boyd has done Mona Lisa work. It's still on Thursday, may not be perfect for every piece. There are a couple of things. There are a couple of things I, I think we can absolutely do in here. There may be a couple consent and notice. Those are bigger, bigger things that we spend a whole lot more time with a lot more stakeholders to have conversation about, but we can put that on to reflect on another time. Uh, but I think we got a lot of feedback today and we can make some small strategic tweaks here that I think can get us to a good place on Thursday. So I do want to say, <laughs> you know, Dr. Brabrand, when I came in in 2017, uh, we were working a lot on SRNR, a lot. And so we have climbed we have, we have just continued that continuous process so I of improvement. So I want to say thank you for that. We haven't arrived. We never will because we, we w always want to do better. So with that. Ms. Keys Gamara. I'm yes. Sorry. Yes. Uh, very, very quickly. I'm sorry. I didn't see that. That's um, go okay. ahead. That's okay. Too many things in the way. Um, I had a conversation with Ms. Bukarski a week or so ago after some very lengthy conversations with constituents. I 100% back the work on the dress code. I just want to throw that out there. So Absolutely, yes. Happy to help with that. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. I'll send it tonight.